weaknesses, not least the frustration that Greece remained neutral and therefore the Navy had to keep him out of the war. Until, that is, the Germans marched into Greece. Prince Philip was to have what was then called a good war. He was mentioned in dispatches. Eric Grove again. The Second World War was an enormous test for the Navy, a test which the Navy stood quite well. People were determined, I think, that the Navy was going to do better this time than it had done in the First World War. And when you look at the record of the fleet in the war, Prince Philip and his contemporaries did pretty well. He served in cruisers, he served in destroyers, he served along the east coast of England, but perhaps the most important battle he was involved in was when he was controlling the searchlights on board the battleship HMS Valiant at the Battle of Cape Matapan in 1941. This was a night action, so control of the searchlights was absolutely crucial. So he did play a very significant role in one of the major naval victories of the Second World War. Well, a minor hero, but Prince Philip would never be simply a naval officer, whatever his instincts and professionalism. His upbringing, an adventure playground for a genealogist, meant that whichever way he pulled, he couldn't escape that wiring diagram of court intrigue and opportunism. Dickie Mountbatten is said to have been determined that his young nephew would one day marry the heir to the throne. Sir Edward Ford, private secretary to King George VI and later to the Queen, remembers watching the gavotte of Mountbatten's matchmaking. I don't think he engineered it, but... It almost certainly true that he had it in mind and that uh, no doubt he uh, may have arranged for appropriate meetings. It was marvellous when Prince Philip was there and she fell in love with him, she certainly did, because he did fit the bill, absolutely to a T. Well, up to a point he did, there were well-recorded problems. Sensitivities surfaced over the German relations, as one member of the royal family called them. It was something Mountbatten understood all too well. His father, Louis Battenberg, had been forced to resign as first sea lord and change his name from Battenberg to Mountbatten because of anti-German sentiment in World War I. At the time their engagement was approved, the marked memory of what some call the Second German War couldn't be ignored. Prince Philip's biographer, Tim Heald. There was a lot of hostility to him early on. He was accepted, I think, very much by the king, who was kind to him and helped him. But there were other people, notably the Queen Mother's brother, for instance, who was very opposed to him on the grounds that he was not only a foreigner, but effectively a German, and a bit of a hustler. He was a pushy character. He clearly had views of his own, and he wanted to enforce them. So he wasn't easy, and a certain sort of... Princess Margaret once referred to, them, to me as uh, the men with moustaches, and one knows what she meant. There was a certain sort of a British establishment figure who was very hostile to him. So he was insecure from that point of view. One obviously felt that he would bring in the outside world into that circle. And being very positive, he was going to say exactly what he thought, and I have no doubt it was very difficult at times for him. Very. The Marquis of Milford Haven's niece, Myra Butter, she'd known Prince Philip since childhood. You've got to look back always how you were at that time and how people thought at that time, and they've changed a good deal on the way. The courtiers obviously thought, who's this brash young man saying these things? Of course, he was saying and thinking exactly what we talk about now, what young people do, you know. It's no different, really. But he was in there, and obviously, he wasn't going to be somebody he wasn't. He said what he thought. But strong will overcomes much, and in July 1947, the engagement was announced. consented together in a holy wedlock. They were married in November, after Prince Philip had given up any claim to the Greek throne, his title of Prince of Greece, his membership of the Greek Orthodox Church, and any ambition he may have had of a career in the Royal Navy. I pronounce that they be man and wife together. Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten RN and Princess Elizabeth were married at a time of dramatic change in British society. The revolution, which had already taken its grip on industrial, economic and social life during the conflict, continued once the war was done. Labour winning by a landslide at the ballot box, the country broke. Bomb sites at every corner, a black market, ration books, a Soviet cordon, Churchill's iron curtain across Eastern Europe, the failure of the great powers to manage the peace when they had managed the war. Yet it was still a decade of hope. Two tyrannies overcome, reform in education, the creation of the National Health Service, the establishment of the United Nations.
the first breath of what Macmillan was later to call the wind of change, independence for India and Pakistan and Burma. The industrialist Sir Peter Parker was there. He later met Prince Philip through the Duke's Commonwealth Study Conference and recognised in the Prince a sense of social understanding. We were feeling, I suppose, like a lot of ex-servicemen, that the country really did need stirring. I mean, we were all pretty tired. The war had exhausted us in so many different ways. But there was the great achievement of the welfare state, but that's a static thing, that's safety. How do we somehow create an atmosphere that's brighter than that and more challenging than that, though in no way undermining it? And so the idea of an inspirational sense of industrial purpose, industry for man rather than man for industry, was a totally shared uh, concept, I think, although he comes on stage right and I come on stage left. But the hopes to do something, to get things going, would have to wait. For the moment, at least, Prince Philip remained a naval officer and a good one. According to Admiral of the Fleet, Lord Lewin, he served with Philip during the war and later in the Mediterranean. He was appointed first lieutenant of the um, destroyer Chequers, which was a flotilla leader. Being first lieutenant of the leader is quite a difficult job because all the other ships in the flotilla are trying to beat the leader. And uh, usually they succeed. And the leader is usually unpopular. Now, Prince Philip was, I should say, the most junior of all the first lieutenants. And so it could have been a disaster, but it wasn't. And he made the ship uh, extremely smart and efficient without making himself unpopular. He went from Chequers to command Magpie. And there, I think, his determination to be a damn good naval officer really showed, because Magpie was an outstanding ship. When he wasn't aboard ship or in a wardroom, home was Clarence House. Lady Abel Smith served the Queen from before her accession to the throne. She remembered a lively family atmosphere and a household run in true naval fashion. He ran Clarence House like a ship. I and mean, Clarence ship knows who is house and goes into every single room. No royal person ever done. And I think the Queen was the first person to go into a housemaid's bedroom at Balmoral to find that there was one tap, no curtains along the passage, and had the whole place modernised, which was obviously the naval training coming out, you know. And he was very thoughtful that we all had fun and we were looked after. Prince Philip's sense of justice and injustice was enhanced by his naval training. Look after your ship's company, then you can ask them to do the impossible. A combination of nous and leadership. All through his life, Philip would know how to get people to do things. Those early years were happy ones. In 1948, Charles was born. Two years later, Princess Anne. The line of succession assured. But the easy days of a naval officer and their distractions from the pressures of court and constitutional life were drawing to a close. By 1951, King George was far from well, cancer. Prince Philip was recalled to London, and that was the end of his active naval career. There's always been speculation that he'd like to have stayed in the Navy. Lord Lewin, though, is not so sure. I think he would have said, well, this is inevitable. Now there is a new challenge. Enormous new horizons opened up to him, of course, being the consort of the Queen much wider opportunities than would have faced him in the Navy to take an interest in the forefront of anything that took his fancy, particularly technology. I think this probably compensated for losing the satisfaction of a hands-on professional career. Not that he ever lost touch with the maritime world. For instance, he was for 42 years master of Trinity House, the body chartered in the reign of Henry VIII to be responsible for the maritime safety of seafarers. But back in the early 1950s, there was much for Prince Philip to do and much to learn. In 1951, Atlantic liners still steamed for the Blue Ribbon. Planes were called aircraft and had propellers. Tanganyika, Nyasaland were marked pink on every British school atlas. Sir George Everest's mountain remained unconquered. A few sitting rooms had a television. Migrants lined up for 10 pound tickets had a new life in Australia. Children at kitchen tables were still told, careful, that's butter. It was time for a change. Step forward, Philip the Impatient. 
Philip the Innovator. Where best to start? The palace, of course. His instinct was for change, not for the sake of it, but to use modern technologies and ideas to wider advantage. For example, when the king was too ill to make a state visit to Canada, it was agreed, at short notice, that the prince and princess must go in his stead. We'll fly, said Prince Philip. Oh, no, you won't, said the court, the government, and anyone else likely to be consulted. You'll go by sea. They flew. And this was, indeed, the dawning of a new Elizabethan age. News reached the travelling Princess Elizabeth in Kenya. The king is dead. Long live the queen. Sir David Butter, Mountbatten's nephew by marriage, remembers this moment of transition. It was difficult for both of them. To become queen at such a very young age, it must have been really quite a task. The whole of their lives suddenly changed from being a very sort of say ordinary couple, but I mean a sort of normal couple, suddenly these tremendous responsibilities thrust on their shoulders much too early, in a way. They hadn't had the chance, really, to settle down. The state's very good on these occasions. The system takes over. But the formality of precedence, protocol, privilege, so glittering to the onlooker, could be deceptive. Lady Abel Smith recounts the profound effect on the royal couple. People didn't realise how awful it really was for her suddenly. She didn't want to go to Buckingham Palace. She got her own home. Queen Mother didn't want to go there. She liked Buckingham Palace. And Prince Philip had no job. And he being the one who ran everything and worked things together, you know, and it was a great help having his youngest sister there, Princess Sophie. And she was wonderful at explaining things and keeping her brother happy, who was very unhappy. And the Queen was very unhappy. And all that she got to contend with was entirely new life, you know. I, Philip, to become your liege man of life and live, the worship, and faith and truth I will bear unto you, live and die. Adaptable and professional and dutiful, but without the formal designation of Prince Consort. You realised it from afar, as much as from near, how very different their lives were from previous year, and how very difficult it all was, particularly, of course, for Prince Philip, because that was a new situation that uh, hadn't arisen since the days of Queen Victoria, that there would be a queen regnant with a consort. And as everybody, I think, now well knows, life was very difficult for him. His cousin, Countess Mountbatten of Burma, I think it's perhaps natural as a sort of slight feeling of resentment amongst the officials that the usurper in the sense that, uh, you know, they're, they're really looking after the monarch and who is this other person and where should he be in, in the setup. He was marvellous at being terribly careful in no way to impinge on the fact that the Queen was the Queen. But it was quite a long time before he was given his rightful due, I think. Victorious Prince Consort, Albert, had a constitutional power. The Duke of Edinburgh, as he then was, had none. He wasn't privy to state secrets, and there's no evidence that he wanted to be. Maybe he understood how restricted he'd be if he'd been formerly Prince Consort. But that doesn't mean that he didn't want something to do, the recognition that he had a contribution to make to the monarchy, and therefore to the country. There's a higgledy-piggledy element to all royal portfolios. The Dukes had been filling up steadily since his marriage, from the Chancellorship of the University of Wales to the presidency of the National Playing Fields Association. Now he began to assemble a list of literally hundreds of patronages and presidencies. But there were perhaps three strands of interest, three constants, which he decided from the word go wouldn't just be hobbies. Each time he was asked to say something on these subjects, he made sure he had something to say. The standard of intelligence, competence, and workmanship in industry, commerce, and agriculture controls absolutely the ability of any country to hold its own in the highly competitive business of international trade. Following from this, it should be obvious that a country's competitive position in world markets is what ultimately controls the comfort and prosperity of the people. My own impression is that the gathering awareness of ordinary people in all countries will make it essential for governments to take the problems of conservation seriously before very long. 
I, I don't think this reflects a, a new and an enlarged capacity for worry. It's simply that we have got something new to worry about. The philosophy of this scheme is neither very profound nor very complicated. It's simply this, that a civilized society depends on the freedom, the responsibility, the intelligence, and the standard of the behavior of its individual members. And if the society is to continue to be civilized, each succeeding generation must learn to value these qualities and standards for themselves. Today, unremarkable thoughts from royalty. Sixty odd years ago, quite another matter. His concepts of social rights and wrongs were established. His thoughts on industry were honed in an increasingly technical Royal Navy, which, after all, had been the first to use computers. Prince Philip's instinct that people should talk to each other so that industry and communities shouldn't work in isolation never left him. Sir Peter Parker. Interesting, because it was saying it against the grain of that time. Quite a difficult job to do that. And he articulated that message. And we all felt we were the advance guard of something which was balancing human and social values against material values. You've got to strike that balance for a healthy community. But he was a generation ahead of pioneering these subjects. Perhaps a better known strand was his interest in wildlife and conservation. There are those who've never reconciled Prince Philip's passion for shooting with his equal passion for preserving wildlife. Aubrey Buxton, the naturalist filmmaker, was duck shooting with Prince Philip when he realized his companion had other thoughts on his mind. I do remember that morning when I think he'd hardly had a shot and there were hardly any duck. The most glorious morning, sunshine and blue skies, and he told me he'd had a marvellous time watching a pair of goldfinches. And that's when I discovered that he was really quite keen on watching behaviour particularly, and not just recognising things, which came as quite a surprise, because although he liked the countryside, I don't think he'd ever taken much notice of it before. And having a very keen and inquisitive mind, he's never prepared to simply sit still with the status quo, so to speak, and just continue as a bird watcher. He immediately goes from there to habitat and conservation and wanting to see them abroad and understand migration and all that sort of thing. And that led over a period of about a decade into him becoming keenly interested in the whole problem of the countryside and nature conservation worldwide. In 1961, Sir Peter Scott invited him to become the first British president of the World Wildlife Fund. Sir Peter was staggered when he sent Prince Philip the draft charter, just something to mull over, perhaps. Oh, no. Within a week, back came a four-page memorandum in the prince's own hat. You see, he says, uh, thank you for your note and the enclosures. I think they all make sense except the charter. I'm afraid I find it unconvincing, confused, and frankly, badly written. I'm sure you could do better than that. As it stands, I'm sure it will put off a great many people who would otherwise be all for preservation. And then he says to go through it paragraph by paragraph. One, I think you must state the threats to wildlife before going into the moral arguments. Two, this is a negative approach, I would emphasize. And it goes up to eight. To be honest, I would suggest you tear the whole thing up and start again. Well, Prince Philip's passions were never short-lived president of the fund for 20 years, then its international president from 1981. Prince Philip saw nature conservation into the very heart of serious debate. And for 20 years, he was the president of the International Equestrian Federation, which controls pretty much everything horsey except racing. He was driving a four in hand well into his 90s. But it was in 1956 that the Duke of Edinburgh launched his award scheme. It's aimed to give every youngster the chance to do something without being forced to, and at the end of it, to have a sense of achievement. Here's its one-time director, Major General Michael Hobbs. He isn't just a leader of a thing. He took enormous trouble in creating a structure which would survive. How many youth organizations are formed in one year and die in the next? And the subtlety of it is that he's got this extraordinary structure across the whole country which he personally devised down to the last word. As Michael Hobbs says, the scheme has survived and is successful worldwide, with more than 8 million young people having received awards in 144 countries. 
But in Britain, rather like Prince Philip himself, it didn't always have the backing of the establishment. It took a long time for it to shed its image as being a scheme for the sons and daughters of the middle classes. That certainly hadn't been what the prince intended. He had to have the idea, create the formula, but he couldn't physically get into the sort of arguments, public arguments, that would have been necessary to either encourage it in certain areas or to discourage it in others. He always quotes that when he went to the education ministry and said, here is the scheme. Later, the Secretary of State, who will remain forever nameless, turned to him and said, I hear you have invented something rather like the Hitler Youth. Now, that to him was a, an appalling insult. A, because it was palpably not what had happened, and B, it was, as it were, a racial insult. It was implying that he was bringing something over. Remember, it's still very close to the war. So he never stopped thinking that government was not going to be his friend over this. Philip had, after all, publicly decided to do something for British youth, which government wasn't doing. The mandarins and the courtiers had already done their best to put him in his place, most firmly after the death of George VI. In 1953, his uncle, Lord Mountbatten, was said to have claimed that the royal house was now his house, the house of Mountbatten. Philip told Churchill he thought it should be the house of Edinburgh, Never, 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 replied the constitutional establishment. It was Churchill who made certain that the Queen understood her family was the House of Windsor. On April the 9th that year, it duly became so by royal proclamation. Prince Philip's expression of disappointment was somehow typical. He was, he remarked to a friend, left us nothing more than an amoeba, a bloody amoeba. Countess Mountbatten of Burma. Suddenly his own children were no longer to bear his own name. And that was a, a terrible blow, it would be for any father and any husband. And I think that arose because Churchill, with his historical sense, wanting the House of Windsor to be established, gave the Queen bad advice on that one, to the extent that the name should be changed. And being a very dutiful monarch, I think she felt that she should accept that advice, perhaps without having quite realised the psychological blow it would be to her husband. It's difficult to appreciate the pressures on the royal family, and so there were rumours, especially around this time, of strains between the Queen and Prince Philip. These persisted during the Duke's extended tour to Australia in the Royal Yacht Britannia. A long time away, birthdays, state occasions and Christmas all missed. And in 1956, there was the saga of Mike Parker, Prince Philip's longtime naval friend and a query. Parker, beneath his sense of naval discipline and duty, was a particularly irreverent Australian and had been with Prince Philip from his earliest days at the palace. Together, they were a formidable, fun-loving team. Live it up, live it up, live it up, live it up, have yourself a ball. The end came with Parker's very public divorce. The Queen was advised, Parker went. An eventful year, but at the end of it, as if to sweep aside once and for all any chatter about rifts and tensions, the Duke of Edinburgh was confirmed as first gentleman of the realm when the Queen dubbed him Prince. It was now that the Prince went to work on some of the stuffiness which hung heavily in the corridors of the royal household. And when, in the 1980s, the Lord Chamberlain, Lord Airlie, oversaw a comprehensive reorganisation in the way it was run and financed, he acknowledged the steps, albeit small ones, made by Prince Philip. He did bring a fresh view to the direction in which the monarchy should be going and the way in which the household was managed. And I think that was probably very timely at the time. And then times moved on, and perhaps the 80s have been another period when it needed to be looked at. And again, he's been enormously supportive. And I think it's fair to say that uh, in many instances, the Queen would defer to him ask him to deal with me direct in relation to a number of different issues that uh, needed to be addressed. There are very few facets of the business of royalty, in the context of the United Kingdom anyway, which he has not actually been involved in in some way or another. Brigadier Sir Miles Hunt Davis, his former private secretary. He can actually see how things perhaps should develop or could develop or could be led to developing. Always an ideas man, curiosity, imagination. 
The Prince had been Ranger of Windsor Great Park since early in the Queen's reign, an office also held by Prince Albert when he was Prince Consort to Queen Victoria. Courtesy title? Well, tell that to Roland Wiseman, the Deputy Ranger. He got very interested in converting the manure from our two dairy herds to anaerobically digest the manure and produce methane gas because he thought, why buy gas from the gas board if you can produce your own from the cow manure? Well, we whacked away at this for ages and ages and ages. It's almost become a joke because I would say, well, I'm terribly sorry, so we're still working on it. But at the end of the day, it's there. Though not without further heartache, as the prince himself revealed. That great tank there is the remains of an attempt to have a biogas plant. Unfortunately, while they were doing something to it, the digester blew up, so we had to get, had to get rid of it. <laughs> it's, it's quite difficult to, to, to get it right. Interestingly, this sort of thing brought Philip up against the contemporary champions of green issues whether it be over the merits of wind farms or, as here, the replanting of trees in Windsor Great Park. Lord Helbrook is uh, amongst the tree huggers and, and all the people who thought we were destroying the oak trees. And can you imagine there were a few decrepit old things and a few that were planted in the wrong place? It seemed as crazy not to straighten it out. We planted a thousand oaks, and what's wrong with that? Prince Philip, whenever he wanted, could surround himself with experts, but he lacked many close friends. Few could keep up with the range of his interests. His private office, along the Privy Purse Corridor in Buckingham Palace, had to. Very small, run like a well-founded frigate. One of the busiest periods was in the 1990s. Sir Brian McGrath was his treasurer, and Sir Miles Hunt Davis his private secretary. It was then that they spoke together about the Prince's approach to work. I think we need to be honest. I mean, if, you make, a, if you make a nonsense, you say so. You say so. Absolutely. Right. You made a mistake and said, look, sir, I've made a nonsense about the way it is. Oh, no, I don't think so. No, no, not really. We can do it that way. And yeah. if there is a hitch, it turns into it almost fast because of his sense of humor. I mean, he doesn't sort of throw a wobbler because the, the car's late right. or, or sometimes he leaves early. He has been known to leave before everybody in the household's actually there. And, I mean, you know, not done deliberately, but if he's got to be there at a time. Of course, the individual concern is in a frightful state, but actually Prince Philip just thinks it's highly abusive. I suppose yeah, honesty, therefore, and punctuality might be the other. Punctuality, but also sticking to your guns. If you think that something should not be done, you're looking at a speech and something could be misconstrued or what have you, you say so, and... He genuinely wants to know what you think. And if you say, I don't think you should do that, or is that fair, or whatever it may be, you immediately change it. Few had insights into Prince Philip. The ones who got close enough to him were loyal to him. And his rule of loyalty meant that while they felt more and more strongly that Prince Philip wasn't given his due, they would never publicly say what they knew. Even the 1960s television programme, Royal Family, didn't much change the public view of the prince. Forty years later, the film The Queen reinforced the stereotype of the conservative and intolerant Philip, while most recently, The Crown brought a fictional dimension to its portrayal. The media revolution, which had started with the televising of the coronation in 1953, meant that the public just went along with these preconceptions. Why? Well, their focus had shifted, first to Charles and, more recently, to William and Harry. Prince Philip's news ratings had slipped, unless, that is, he produced one of his gaffes. Once I saw her pull a face a little bit at uh, one of Prince Philip's... Uh, <laughs> ...characteristic. He meant well, but it was just an amazing thing to say. Lord Runcie, former Archbishop of Canterbury, at a state banquet, the Archbishop, by protocol, is the first to be introduced to the current head of state. Sometimes the head of state is a bit surprised to be introduced to a figure in a silk stockings and a purple coat and a clerical collar on, you see. So <laughs> it was one of the Arab rulers and the Queen, he said, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And Philip, uh, to help him, leant forward and said, he's our Ayatollah, you know. <laughs> I passed on hastily. 
1969, when the British economy was again on its uppers, Prince Philip publicly remarked that something had to be done about the civil list or he'd have to sell his polo ponies. Not a tactful remark, but these East End dockers took his point. Having given us a great deal of incentive about 15 years ago with the boys' clubs and that, we just thought we'd sort of send him a little present of some kind, maybe a big present, we don't know yet, and give him some incentive to carry on with his sport. Um, if he's short, it's not quite the same as other people being short. No, I mean, he's done something for us, now we're just going to do something for him. Just, I mean, everyone's having a pop with a fellow lately, so we're just going to show him there's someone who's behind him for a change. One of the only monarchists ever got up and spoke his mind. We like that. Why not? There was always something about him that understood people under pressure and how to relieve some of it. It was his naval background. Very important to see that as more than gold stripes and the rows of medals. The round the world yachtsman Sir Robin Knox Johnston worked with him in the Sail Training Association and at the Maritime Museum, Greenwich. I've always thought, you know, that with the dislocated childhood he must have had, his first real home, where he first had real security, was when he joined the Royal Navy. And it always used to annoy me. He'd come out with a jocular remark, which was absolutely typical of something you'd hear on the lower deck in the Navy. And, of course, the newspapers would go for him. For example? Well, I mean, when he visited China and he said to people, how long have you been here? And he said, you don't want to stay much longer, you know, you'll, you'll get narrowed eyes. On the lower deck in the Royal Navy, that would be a good joke, wouldn't it? You'd say it as a funny joke. You wouldn't particularly mean it. It was just a funny thing to say. And Jolly Jack would go right back and say, oh, sir came up with a good one. And we'd all have a laugh about it. And that's one of the way you built up the camaraderie between the officers and the men. Any of us who'd been at sea sort of said, well, it's a funny, but it's not serious. Except that the prince wasn't Jolly Jack ashore. He was one of the most potent symbols of modern royalty and therefore vulnerable. What's more, he believed in the symbolism of royalty, and that required circumspection, the lack of which was made all too painfully clear in the public humiliation of his children's failed marriages and the circumstances of those humiliations. Take, for example, the Princess of Wales, as she then was, Diana's biographer, Sarah Bradford. Prince Philip liked Diana, and he tried to jolly her along. You know, he'd... Um whirl her into the dining room when she came down all depressed after being sick or ill or something like that. And he'd write her one of his helpful letters on his famous laptop. I think that he began to lose patience with her. But I think he always felt a certain amount of sympathy and perhaps he even felt that after all he had been partly responsible for the marriage in a way that I think he did pushed Prince Charles into this marriage. That lost patience was underlined when letters from Prince Philip to Diana were cited at the very public inquest into the deaths of Diana and her companion, Dodi al -Fayed. Slowly, though, calm was restored. When Camilla Parker Bowles's status had been accepted by her marriage to Prince Charles in 2005, another embarrassing issue for both the Queen and Prince Philip had been resolved at least on the surface. And after that, as often happens with popular attitudes to the royal family, public opinion shifted. Anyway, for Philip, there were still such monarchical verities as a sense of duty. His biographer, Tim Heald. A very strong sense that being royal made you in some way different, mainly in the sense that it did oblige you to do certain things. And I think that one of the things that distressed him most about the relative disintegration of the royal family, particularly of the younger members, was that that seemed to involve a dereliction of duty, that, you know, there were certain things that you bloody well, as he would say, get on and do. And I think that the fact that they didn't seem to be doing that riled him a lot. Was he an impatient sailor all his life? Some wondered whether he actually liked his children. Sarah Bradford again. Prince Philip was much maligned as a father. I think when the children were small, he was actually more paternal than the Queen was maternal. He loved playing with the children. I think as the children grew up, things became more difficult, particularly between Prince Philip and the Prince of Wales. I think they were very different characters. And, of course, Prince Philip expected more of the Prince of Wales because the Prince of Wales was the heir to the throne 
And I think that he was quite tough and demanding and critical. Prince Philip never distinguished between the royal family and the institution of the monarchy itself. His fear was that public contempt would undermine it. In fact, public expectations of the modern monarchy became more realistic. For its part, the royal family recognised that ultimately the troubles of the House of Windsor were part of a quiet revolution. The British way of doing things, if you like. Lord Braybourne, producer of the television film Royal Family. A lot of things have happened. Maybe, maybe some things could have been avoided. But the majority, I don't believe, could. It's a change of feeling about everything, presently, everything in the whole situation. It's the way I believe that the British go through a revolution. It's just the way they do it. They don't shoot each other. It's just it becomes a social thing. With all these pressures, Prince Philip could have easily retired to Sandringham and Balmoral and Buckingham Palace for state occasions. But he didn't. That wasn't his style. And anyway, in 2011, the royal family show was back on the road. In April that year, Prince William married Catherine Middleton. The Rolls Royce has just emerged from the right-hand gates of Buckingham Palace, and you can hear the response of the crowds as that car moves slowly past with the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh in that back seat. It was shortly afterwards, on the eve of his 90th birthday, that Prince Philip did announce a scaling back in his activities, but done on his own terms and in his own way. I reckon I've done my bit. I, I want to enjoy myself from there with less responsibility, less frantic rushing about, less preparation, less trying to think of something to say. On top of that, memories going. Yes, I, I'm just sort of winding down. And then, at the age of 96, came the announcement that, from the summer of 2017, he would no longer carry out solo public duties. His final engagement took place in pouring rain on the parade ground at Buckingham Palace and was marked by the band of the Royal Marines in fitting style. Time to ease up. As his Navy would say, time to make amend. Time to take more care. In January 2019, while driving close to the Sandringham estate, he was involved in an accident in which two other patients were injured. He could have been prosecuted, but wasn't. For much of his time in public life, he missed a little. He constantly was asking why, seemingly born with the need to sort things out. Brigadier Clive Robertson, his assistant private secretary throughout the 1980s, has a favourite memory of the boss in action in far-off Madagascar. The World Bank were going to give some money to improve things in the island if they would agree to having a conservation strategy. At that time, the island was really being destroyed. The whole of the north was suffering from what they call slash and burn. They cut down the trees, the rains would come down, the topsoil would be swept away out down to the rivers and out to sea. And he didn't think that some of the members of the government believed this. And so he said, right, he said, I'll show you what's happening to your island. You come with me. And he took them up in the old Andover in those days and flew over the northern part of the island. And it was very, very vivid and very stark. Here was all this water rushing down the rivers, bright red because the silk was red in that part of the world coming out to sea. He said, look down there. He said, you're bleeding your home. You're bleeding your island to death. Now, I always thought that was a very uh, good example of him bringing together politics, the environment, conservation, and very real leadership. A man of tremendous ideas, intelligence, and energies. But with all the things that he did, how do we assess his achievements? His friends and the people he worked with will tell you the public only knew a tiny amount of what he did for his country and the world. He never believed in the obvious. Take, for example, the universal acceptance of the global positioning system, GPS, that constellation of satellites that tell us exactly where we are on Earth. As master of Trinity House, he was infuriated that people didn't understand what would happen if GPS was shut down. Rear Admiral Sir Jeremy Halpert was Prince Philip's deputy master at Trinity House. Prince Philip, from the very beginning, 
understood that it was a single point of failure. GPS can be jammed very easily. And if you jam GPS, you not only lose your position, but you also lose the timing signal that goes to banking, internet, mobile phones, uh, hospital machinery, traffic light systems, the national grid, and so on and so on. So critical infrastructure uh, around the country falls over. And he encouraged us to move ahead and make sure that the country has a fail-safe backup, which we have done, and it is now operational. But the inevitable question about the man was, what would have happened to him if he'd not married Princess Elizabeth? Lord Mountbatten once said he believed that Prince Philip most certainly would have become first sea lord, and then added, should we have wished? But perhaps it's too easy to suggest that a man in his position had to have achievements which we could all evaluate. His blue plaques are rather the people he motivated, and they're not necessarily high officers of state or personal friends. They're far more likely to be the scientists and industrialists he made to stop and think. Youngsters with certificates and medals for his award. Delegates from around the world coming together at one of his Commonwealth study groups. But the lasting memory of Prince Philip must be his partnership with the Queen, Lady Abel Smith. I'd been with the Queen to a regimental dinner. It was Windsor Horse Show, which is all, this, all the German and Hungarian cousins come and stay. And, of course, we were an hour late coming back to Windsor from here. And she said, oh, I hope they've all gone to bed. And I said, well, all the lights are on. Well, I think they would be for me, she said. But <laughs> well, idiotic of me, it's a remark I would make. And we went up into the sitting room. <laughs> and the oak room, which is where they said, and there was Prince Philip reading the newspaper. Oh, you're still up. And the warmest and coziest of embraces. I thought I'd wait till you came home. That teased me very much. It's been a challenge for us, but by trial and experience, I believe we have achieved a sensible division of labour and a good balance between our individual and joint interests. Of course, after 50 years of experience, I find there's a great temptation to give advice. <clears throat> the trouble is that no two marriages are quite alike. However, I think that the main lesson that we've learned is that tolerance is the one essential ingredient of any happy marriage. It may not be quite so important when things are going well, but it is absolutely vital when things get difficult. And uh, you can take it from me, that the Queen has the quality of tolerance and abundance. Prince Philip remained a constant in the Queen's life. He was one of the few in the family who recognised that. While she personally was very popular, that alone wouldn't be enough to secure the future of the monarchy. As the marriages of their children demonstrated, the modern institution was fallible and had to accept its fallibility. It didn't find it easy comfortable adaptations were passed. Could it still have meaning to the nation and retain a dignified role in the Constitution? With Prince Philip's death, those questions remain. But at a personal level, he did succeed in showing the continued relevance of traditional values. From decade to decade, royal birthday to royal birthday, he made it his role to support the Queen. Such loyalty and steadfastness were sometimes mocked as unfashionable. But that, perhaps, was precisely their point, as the monarch, above all, recognised. He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family, and this and many other countries, owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. That special programme, presented by Edward Sturton, marked the passing announced earlier today of His Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. It was written by Christopher Lee and the producer was Simon Coates.
BBC News. The Queen's husband, the Duke of Edinburgh, has died. Prince Philip was 99, just two months short of his 100th birthday and the longest serving consort in British history. The Queen and the Duke were married for more than 70 years and Prince Philip dedicated decades of his life to royal duty at his wife's side. In a statement, Buckingham Palace said of the Queen's deep sorrow at his death. The palace said he'd passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. Prince Philip had returned there three and a half weeks ago after spending a month in hospital. He initially received care for an infection before undergoing heart surgery. For decade after decade, no one was closer to the Queen than Prince Philip. His was the support that mattered most. Famously forthright, he was once asked to sum up his contribution. I've just done what I think is my best. I mean, it, 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 some people think it, it, it was all right. Other people quite evidently don't. What can you do? I, I can't suddenly change my whole way of doing things. I can't change my interests. I can't change my, the way in which um, I react to things. It's, it's, it's part of it's somebody's style, and, and it's too bad. It's lumpy. Philip was born on the Greek island of Corfu, the son of a prince, in June 1921. During the Second World War, he served in the Royal Navy and was mentioned in dispatches. He first met Princess Elizabeth when she was 13 in 1939. They married eight years later. When she became queen in 1952, Philip had no constitutional role. He focused his considerable energies on issues like the environment and conservation. He created the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme, which offered challenges and adventure to tens of thousands of young people and became their champion. When a group of young people like binge drinkers appear, everybody's thinking, my God, the young people are terrible, they all become binge drinkers. Well, they haven't. It's that one group who were mods and rockers a few generations. You probably won yourself. I mean, people well, go through... <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you never know. People become quite civilised when they grow up. During the most difficult week of the Queen's reign, after the death of Princess Diana in 1997, Prince Philip walked with his grandsons, William and Harry, behind their mother's coffin. In 2011, he marked his 90th birthday with a typically frank admission of the reality of, of advancing age. He told the BBC he was reducing his workload, getting out before he reached his sell-by date. I reckon I've done my bit. I, I want to enjoy myself now. With less responsibility, less uh, frantic rushing about, less preparation, less trying to think of something to say. Yeah, so I'm just sort of winding down. Prince Philip's final solo engagement came at the age of 96. After that, his life was much quieter, spent mostly at the Queen's estate at Sandringham. It was driving away from there in 2019 that his car overturned. He was badly shaken and gave up his driving licence. The Duke's support to his wife, the Queen, in public and in private underpinned the success of her long reign. In a speech marking their golden wedding anniversary in 1997, the Queen paid her husband this tribute. He has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. Speaking at Downing Street shortly after the news of the Duke's death was confirmed, Boris Johnson said the nation would mourn with the Queen, who had lost her strength and stay. Prince Philip earned the affection of generations here in the United Kingdom, across the Commonwealth and around the world. He was the longest serving consort in history, one of the last surviving people in this country to have served in the Second World War. He helped to steer the royal family and the monarchy so that it remains an institution indisputably vital to the balance and happiness of our national life. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, added that Prince Philip had shown great devotion to his country. The UK has lost an extraordinary public servant in Prince Philip. He dedicated his life to our country. And above all, I think he'll be remembered for his support and devotion to the Queen. And all of our thoughts are with the Queen, the royal family and the British public as they come together to mourn this huge loss. Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, said the Prince was widely admired by the Scottish people. He had a close association, of course, with Scotland. He went to school 
in Scotland. Uh, I know uh, that he enjoyed all of the time he spent at Balmoral. He had a very long association as Chancellor with the University of Edinburgh. But probably above all of that, the Duke of Edinburgh Awards scheme transformed the lives and gave hope and inspiration to countless numbers of young people. The First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, expressed his own sadness at the Duke's passing. Throughout his long life, Prince Philip served with selfless devotion and a remarkable generosity of spirit. The Duke of Edinburgh will be sorely missed by the many Welsh organisations that he supported as patron or president over so many decades of service. Northern Ireland's First Minister Arlene Foster said Philip had a profound and positive impact on her country. Prince Philip was widely respected for his active and dedicated service to the country and for his steadfast support to Her Majesty the Queen throughout her reign. He had a strong interest in Northern Ireland and I had the privilege of meeting him here on a number of his many visits. I offer my deepest sympathies and condolences to Her Majesty the Queen and to all the members of the royal family at this sad time. The Cabinet is currently meeting so ministers can pay tribute to the Duke, while Parliament will be recalled from its Easter recess a day early on Monday. The main political parties have also agreed to suspend campaigning for next month's local elections in England and elections to the Senate and Holyrood. Monarchs, heads of state and prime ministers across the world, both past and present, have been sending condolences. The US President Joe Biden said that over the course of his 99 years, Prince Philip saw the world change dramatically and repeatedly, and he had gladly dedicated himself to the people of the UK, the Commonwealth and to his family. Here's our world affairs correspondent, Paul Adams. From the royal houses of Europe to the furthest corners of the Commonwealth, a flood of condolences and tributes reflects the Duke of Edinburgh's international presence and the strength of his personality. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi praised the Duke for his distinguished military career and community service. Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau called him a man of great purpose and conviction, while Australia's leader Scott Morrison said Prince Philip embodied a generation that would never be seen again. In Pakistan, the Prime Minister Imran Khan described him as a wise elder, while Kenya's President Uhuru Kenyatta called the Duke a towering symbol of family values and unity. There were personal touches too. Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel highlighted what she called Prince Philip's straightforwardness, while the former US President George W. Bush said he and his wife had enjoyed the charm and wit of the Duke's company. The Archbishop of Canterbury has led tributes from faith leaders to the Duke of Edinburgh, describing him as an outstanding example of Christian service. Justin Wilby said he was struck by his obvious joy at life, his inquiring mind, and his ability to communicate with people from every background and walk of life. The Archbishop of Westminster and head of the Roman Catholic Church in England and Wales, Cardinal Vincent Nichols, said his heart went out to the whole of the royal family. I think especially of Harry, actually. Uh, so far away, uh, in California, and his granddad has died. And, uh, and I think, you know, he will have uh, a special place in, in my prayers over these next few days. The Chief Rabbi Ephraim Mervis said he was deeply moved by the Duke of Edinburgh's extraordinary sense of duty and that he'd been a role model for staying active in later years. Members of the public have also been paying their respects, including these people at Windsor Castle. I'm 19 and I hadn't realised how much he'd done for the environment. So it's lovely to see people laying flowers but taking them out the plastic as well, sort of, to commemorate what he did for the environment. Such a great man, uh, all the service he gave to our country. The end of an era, isn't it? Yeah. They won't make him like him anymore. The theologian and environmentalist Martin Palmer, co-founded the Alliance of Religions and Conservation with the Duke in 1995, and the two became friends. He said Prince Philip liked to be challenged and they had some amazing rows that had remained extremely close. He always gave you the feeling that he was delighted to be supporting something that you were doing, as long as you did it well, rather than that he was in charge. He read so extensively when he retired. I said, the thing that most terrifies me about this is you'll have time to read even more books and quote them at me. He was, quite seriously, to be honest, one of the best mates I've ever had.
Martin Palmer paying tribute to the Duke of Edinburgh, who's died at the age of 99. BBC News. Hello, everybody. You're listening to Five Live. Anna Foster and Tony Lives are here until 8 o'clock this evening. There is a change in our schedule today, of course, to reflect the death of the Duke of Edinburgh. The 99-year-old died peacefully at Windsor Castle this morning and Buckingham Palace released the following statement. It is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen has announced the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Tributes are, as you would expect, pouring in from all around the world and we'll reflect those for you throughout the programme tonight. Speaking at Downing Street earlier, Boris Johnson said that Prince Philip inspired the lives of countless young people. Here is the Prime Minister's statement in full. It was with great sadness that a short time ago I received word from Buckingham Palace that His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh has passed away at the age of 99. Prince Philip earned the affection of generations here in the United Kingdom, across the Commonwealth and around the world. He was the longest serving consort in history, one of the last surviving people in this country to have served in the Second World War, at Cape Matapan, where he was mentioned in dispatches for bravery, and in the invasion of Sicily, where he saved his ship by his quick thinking. And from that conflict, he took an ethic of service that he applied throughout the unprecedented changes of the post-war era. Like the expert carriage driver that he was, he helped to steer the royal family and the monarchy so that it remains an institution indisputably vital to the balance and happiness of our national life. He was an environmentalist and a champion of the national world, natural world long before it was fashionable. With his Duke of Edinburgh award scheme, he shaped and inspired the lives of countless young people. And at literally tens of thousands of events, he fostered their hopes and encouraged their ambitions. We remember the Duke for all of this, and above all, for his steadfast support for Her Majesty the Queen. Not just as her consort, by her side every day of her reign, but as her husband, her strength and stay of more than 70 years. And it is to Her Majesty and her family that our nation's thoughts must turn today because they have lost not just a much-loved and highly respected public figure, but a devoted husband and a proud and loving father, grandfather, and in recent years, great grandpa. Speaking on their golden wedding anniversary, Her Majesty said that our country owed her husband a greater debt than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. And I'm sure that estimate is correct. So we mourn today with Her Majesty the Queen. We offer our condolences to her and to all her family. And we give thanks as a nation and a kingdom for the extraordinary life and work of Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Well, that was the Prime Minister Boris Johnson speaking at Downing Street earlier today. The leader of the opposition, Sir Keir Starmer, paid this tribute. Well, the UK has lost an extraordinary public servant. He dedicated his life to our country. And above all, I think, will be remembered for his support and devotion to the Queen. And all of our thoughts are with the Queen, the royal family and the British public as they come together to mourn this huge loss. Well, the Cabinet is meeting now and the Commons will be recalled on Monday, one day early from the Easter recess for MPs to pay tribute. All political parties have also suspended their campaigning for the local elections in May. In a moment, we'll speak to our correspondent at Windsor Castle, Duncan Kennedy. Before that, let's take a moment to reflect on some of Prince Philip's early life. He was born on the Greek island of Corfu in June 1921, was a member of the Greek royal family. But he had a turbulent childhood between relatives in Germany and Britain, as he later recalled. I was a refugee. And I left Greece when I was one. And uh, at that time, they then had a republic. So we, in fact, travelled on Danish passports. 
the other branch of the family very kindly and provided with us, otherwise we wouldn't have stayed here. In 1939, Prince Philip joined the Royal Navy and began training at Dartmouth Naval College. He kept in touch throughout the war with the then Princess Elizabeth, and the pair married at Westminster Abbey in 1947. I, Against all manner of folks, so that's the point. Well, the early years of Philip's married life were happy ones. His naval career flourished, especially when he was based in Malta. But this wasn't to last. The couple were in Kenya when they were told that the Queen's father, King George VI, had died. Philip's private secretary, Michael Parker, gave him the news. Well, as you can imagine, he woken up and to be told the Queen's father, the King, had just died. I don't think I'd ever seen a person so shattered in all my life. It looked to me as though the whole world had dropped on him. Well, his most lasting legacy may well be the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme that was designed to encourage youngsters to stretch themselves physically and mentally. So much has been said about that today. In fact, we'll talk about that through the programme. And if it was something you did and you'd like to share your memories of, we'd love to hear them, please. Do get in touch in all the usual ways. It was founded in partnership with his old headmaster, Kurt Hahn. It was based on Hahn's theory that you shouldn't be a specialist in any one thing and, and he felt that you shouldn't concentrate entirely on academic education. His idea, philosophy That's was that if you could get young people to succeed in any area of activity, that mere sensation of success would spread over into a lot of others. Prince Philip was a father, a grandfather and a great-grandfather. He was at the Queen's side through decades of celebrations and challenges. In a speech marking their golden wedding anniversary in 1997, the Queen paid him this tribute. He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family, and this and many other countries, owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim, or we shall ever know. In June 2011, the Duke marked his 90th birthday and he told the BBC he was reducing his workload because it was better to get out before you reach your sell-by date. I've done my bit. I, I want to enjoy myself for a bit now. Um, with less responsibility, less uh, frantic rushing about, less preparation, less trying to think of something to say. And on top of that, memories going. I can't remember names and things. Yes, I, I'm just sort of winding down. Well, Prince Philip passed away peacefully this morning at Windsor Castle. Our correspondent, Duncan Kennedy, is there for us now. Duncan, just set the scene, will you, for us? What's happening there at the moment? Well, Tony, I, I would describe it as a sombre mood. It's a very nice day here, a slight chill. The town is full of people, but it's also at the same time quiet here. It's that paradox of these kinds of occasions. Two locations that people are mostly gathering, although the vast majority are not dwelling for long. One is in front of the main gate of the castle and the other is on what's called the Long Walk, which is this vast, elegant avenue that leads up to the Cambridge Gate. Some are laying flowers, although they're being asked not to because it encourages crowds. I did speak to two young women who'd driven 10 miles to place a bouquet here in Windsor and I asked why they'd done that. And they said simply that they just liked the Duke of Edinburgh and felt that it was the right thing to do. What level of connection specifically did the Duke have to Windsor, Duncan? Well, it really was an important place for both the Duke and the Queen. It was everything from a family home to, latterly, a, a haven in the pandemic. I mean, right up until he was 97, just a couple of years ago, he was driving his horses on carriages here through the Great Park. Um, he set up a farm shop here. He established the headquarters of the Duke of Edinburgh Awards here. Um, he also set up this International Centre for Dialogue, which brought in many influential people to discuss the issues of the day. That was set up in the grounds of Windsor Castle. But it was also, I think, a place to get out of London, get away from Buckingham Palace, but also to be near London. It's about a 40-minute drive west of London. And here, he and the Queen could relax, but also, at the same time, they could stay connected with what was going on in the capital. 
And just looking uh, finally, Duncan, to the days ahead, it's no secret that rehearsals are held for royal funerals and plans are in place for, for years. What, what Do we know anything about what might happen over the next few days and how it's all going to be affected by the, the pandemic? We've had a few details from what's called the College of Arms. We know, for example, that it's not going to be a state funeral um, because he was the Queen's consort. He, he wasn't the head of state. Um, we understand that the Duke will lie in rest in Windsor Castle ahead of the funeral and that the funeral will be in St George's Chapel here in line with custom and his wishes. And although the chapel, which is where most recently perhaps Meghan and Harry, Prince Harry, were married, people will be familiar with it, it can... Uh, take up to 800 people. There won't be anything like that because of the pandemic conditions that we're in. Um, the arrangements have been revised in the light of the circumstances of COVID and the public will be asked not to attend or participate in any of the events simply to keep it all safe. Um, it is a place that the Duke knew well. Um, St George's Chapel was the place where his mother, for example, Princess Alice of Greece, was buried in 1969 until her coffin was moved. It's also the burial place for many others, including King George VI, the Queen Mother, and the Duke of Windsor in 1972. So a place very well known to the Duke, and the funeral uh, that will take place here was in line with his wishes. Um, but as to the date and the exact moment of that funeral, that hasn't been published yet, but it is what the Duke would have wanted. Duncan, thank you very much indeed. Duncan Kennedy there, our correspondent reporting from Windsor Castle. Well, during his life, Prince Philip rarely gave interviews, but he did speak to the BBC to mark his 70th birthday. The presenter, John Humphreys, asked the Duke of Edinburgh what made him join the Royal Navy back in 1939. You must remember that I was um, 17 in 1930, whenever it was, nine. And, uh, <clears throat> and that was, well, 30, 38, I suppose it was. Then the, the war was threatening and... and I didn't have anything else to, you know, in mind particularly, and it was quite obvious that everybody was going to get involved. So I, I, it was, it was apparent to me that the best thing that I could do was to join one of the services anyway, if I could. And at that time, I was virtually stateless. I think uh, I had a Danish passport, but I, the, the navy said that they'd accept me. And so I went into the navy. I think certainly at the at, at the instigation of my uncle. Uh, Lord Mountbatten, but I think probably if left to my own devices, I probably would have joined the Air Force, I think. But then I wouldn't have been here now. Why? Well, do you, do you know anybody who joined the Air Force in 1939, still alive today? That's <laughs> very, assuming that... Very you, few, I can tell you. You're assuming perhaps you'd have been a fighter pilot, is that right? Well, not? either pilot, or any, any sort of pilot had a jolly difficult time. Um, statistically, it was quite impossible for any bomber crew to do a full tour of 20 sorties. Moving back from, from the Air Force, to which you never did join to the Navy, which you did, there's a, a, a model here of, of the ship you commanded, the Magpie. Mm. What about that period, being in command of a ship? But it didn't last very long. <laughs> I, only, I only had her for a year because uh, I then had to... Well, it, it all got rather difficult. If you remember, the late King was, was not very well, and um, it was decided that, uh, the Queen should, that we should go to Canada in 1951, so I had to come back for that. And then the king was going to go to Australia, and uh, he couldn't, so we were sent off on that. And then, of course, he died. So that was the end of the, of, of, of the sort of naval career. I think I read a comment from you to the effect that the one what-if that you regret is that you weren't able to continue a career in the Navy. Well, it'd be very unnatural if, I, if, 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 you're, if you're in a career and doing reasonably well not to regret um, completing it, or at least continuing with it. Didn't Lord Lewin once say that if you'd stayed on in the Navy, you'd have become first sea lord? Oh, um, what if? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. As who can tell? But it was a regret. You, 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 you regretted it at the well, time. Well, I mean, I think it's only natural. I'm not, I'm not saying that, it's, that I'm, my heart's pining at the thought. But, I mean, uh, just seen in the abstract, it, it, uh, you know, it would, have, it would have been nice to go on, yes. Can I ask you about some of your other charitable work, first of all, the, the Sail Training Association? Now, why that? Why your close involvement with that? Well, because I, I mean, I had the, the, the experience of, of doing some uh, sailing and being put, sent to sea, as it were, in, a, in a, effectively a sail training ship, but while I was at school. 
And it seemed to me that it was a, it was a marvelous experience. It's the sort of thing that you don't get in the ordinary course of events. You're, you're, people in our modern kind of uh, technological era, you, it really doesn't matter to them whether it rains or it blows or it's wet or it's cold. You just get indoors or you... Uh, the thing about going to sea is you're suddenly exposed to, to an element which, is, which you can't really control. You're subject to it. And I think that's quite good for the soul, frankly. Is that what you enjoy yourself about sailing? I, well, that's rather different. I think that now it comes to competitive sailing is rather a different uh, exercise. But um, no, I don't, I, don't, and I don't enjoy the physical discomfort of it. And that's why I don't go in for, for ocean racing or anything that sort of offshore racing. Uh, in fact, the, the great thing about most of these occasions is that it, it feels marvellous when you finish, not, not while you're actually doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but I notice a, a picture in, in your room here of Bloodhound, mm. which you were very fond of, I gather. Mm. What was the appeal of that? And where, why did you stop racing it, why, uh, uh, sailing it? Uh, well, I, well, it was too expensive. <laughs> as simple as that. Really? Just that? Well, yes. But you've had a close affinity with, with, with the sea and sailing for, for many of your years. You were very friendly with uh, for Fox. Well, I've always been rather uh, partial to, to eccentrics, I suppose. And he, he was eccentric par excellence. And, and a, a very, very entertaining character. And an absolutely charming and delightful and kind person. I mean, he couldn't have tried hard. And he took it upon himself to... to introduce me really to, to, to competitive sailing in the Solent, which is rather different to anything else that I'd ever done. And he was a marvellous person to be with. He was, he was a great companion. I think some people might call him a rough diamond. Yeah, yeah I suppose so. <laughs> I thought he was pretty polished. <laughs> Uh, that was a rare interview from the Duke of Edinburgh speaking to John Humphreys uh, on the occasion of his 70th birthday. Well, between now and when we hand to uh, Five Life Sport at 8 o'clock, we'd like to hear your stories of any encounters you may have had uh, with Prince Philip on various royal visits or otherwise. Um, unarguably, I would say, after hearing a lot of the tributes today, one of his longest-lasting legacies will be the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme. We're going to look at that in detail after half past six. Uh, before six o'clock tonight, we'll hear from one of its ambassadors, Sir Michael Paling. Uh, if you took that scheme, we'd love to hear how it may have changed your life. You know how to get in touch. The normal number's 85058 at BBC Five Live. Um, and talking of personal encounters, Jeff from Barnet got in touch with us earlier this afternoon and he told me how he met Prince Philip every year for 20 years. I officially represent the civilian war dead of the, this country, the people that were killed by the German bombing. I'm actually a war orphan. My parents were killed in this, uh, November 1940 when I was three years old. And for the last 20 odd years, officially at the... Garden of Remembrance, uh, we have a plot where we are remembered along with the other service and other civilian uh, units that were affected by the war. And for some 20 years now, I've had the honour and privilege of meeting Prince Philip. Uh, we had a very good relationship in so much that he always came over and carried on the conversation that we finished the year before. Um, which was, which was quite amazing to me, but, you know, the number of people that he met during a year that he could come over and, you know, just start a conversation with me, literally the one that we left off. We explained, we explained uh, had many jokes together, uh, he had a sharp sense of humour, and he would loved it if you turned the joke back on him. And uh, being a good sailor, there was a lot of uh, use of bloody in between the conversation, but... I, I was um, very, always very pleased to meet him because he, he was always very sympathetic to the to the association that I represented. Um, and the, um, I had the the last time we met up, um, he came over. He said, "Hello, how are you?" And I said, "Very well, sir." He said, "You're looking bloody good, by the way." And I said. Also, more important, how are you keeping? He said, I am all right, don't believe the papers. He said, I like, brought the boy with He always referred to Prince Harry as the boy. And uh, I, he said, You met him? I said, Yes, sir, you introduced me last year. So I did, so I did. And Harry was going down the other line of veterans, and he, he turned around and he shouted out, Harry, don't forget to 
talk to this gentleman, you'll find he's very interesting. And unfortunately, we then realized that Philip wasn't going to come and see us anymore, which was such a great shame. Yes, he chose, didn't he, to retire from public life. But, Je Jeff, your story's fascinating because I've read and heard a lot today about how the Duke of Edinburgh prided himself on trying to put people at ease when he was in their company, and it sounds as though you got to see behind the royal facade that many of us didn't and, and were surprised by that in, in, in a good way. In a very good way. I say we exchanged jokes. One joke I can't repeat on air, but the cameras had to go, had to cut. <laughs> Um, he, he, you know, a bit salty as an ex naval man, but uh, he, he was always very interested in uh, me as an individual and what I was doing, e even though we, uh, you know, um, uh, I'm an ex national serviceman, so that was something of interest to him. Uh, so we occasionally discussed the role that uh, us boys played in the, uh, the so called Cold War. And uh, he, he was a delight to meet. I, I saw a number of episodes where of his generosity that, was, that never made the press. Um, have we got a minute for this? Yes, he, um, absolutely. Opposite me is a, a gentleman who represents the, uh, the Balkans veterans, and he's unfortunately in a wheelchair. And I heard Prince Philip say to him, what do you mean they told you you don't qualify for an electric wheelchair? And Philip turned to his entourage and said, I think this gentleman qualifies for an electric wheelchair, don't you? And th this guy, when I see him now, is in an electric wheelchair. I I've seen him many times go over, especially to one elderly sailor, um, who he always made a beeline to go and speak to, and I, I had a very good idea that they may have served together during the war. And. Um, uh, he, he was a man very generous in spirit and uh, never stood in any, uh, many, any ceremonies with you. And uh, he, lo he loved to talk to people and he loved it if you could, you know, carry on and have a conversation. You know, forget I'm royal, you know, I'm somebody interested in you, Let, let's talk. And that's what I would always admire about. And, and Jeff, he, he, he struck a particular chord, particularly with those who've, who lived through the Second World War. He, and indeed, he was a, a hero in his own right. He'd been mentioned in dispatches uh, during naval activity. How, how and, and, and today, Jeff, as we reflect on his life, it, it, it can be seen as a generational thing. There'll be many young people who will have seen him in pictures accompanying the Queen. They may have even done the Duke of Edinburgh Award. Yes. But not all will have experienced his early life and, 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 and some of the stories that you've told us today. How would you, just to end, how would you tell a young person about the life of the Duke of Edinburgh and his his value to the nation in the role that he played? Well, I, 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 I'm fortunate. I've got two families, and my youngest daughter rang me today because she knows that I have met Prince Philip and expressed her sympathy. And because of the the friendship that the man gave, he, he was so interested in young people. He set up the... You know, the scheme the, for the young people to get their badges. And I say that he, he was of a generation which now I'm one of the dwindling ones. Uh, you know, we're, we're the Blitz kids. Uh, we lived through the war. Um, that's another story in its, uh, on, its, on its own. Uh, you know, we, 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 we slept in shelters. So, in a way, we went through the war the same as men like Prince Philip or an active service, and of course, my generation, we also did our two years national service. So, in a way, we had a link with with the uh, our brothers, uncles, and fathers who fought in the war through our own two years of service. Uh, Jeff, just to end, you, you know, you, you as you said, you had a relationship with him for twenty years, albeit. Uh, uh, briefly, those meetings, but you said they resonated for both of you. What is your one abiding memory of the Duke of Edinburgh? His, his friendship and the fact that he was personally interested in in anybody that he, he, he spoke to. And, and that I will always... I have the pleasure of meeting other members of the royals. Um, Prince Harry comes very close to him, I will tell you that. And, uh, but Prince Philip... 
is genuine friendship. That That's the bit that I will always remember. Uh, recollections there from Jeff in Barnet. We, we're looking for your uh, moments, perhaps, when you encountered the Duke of Edinburgh, or particularly when you took the Duke of Edinburgh Award and how it may have changed your life. Thank you. We've had so many texts in already. We'll get to those uh, as soon as we can. You're listening to Drive on Five Live. Uh, we are reflecting the news of the death of the Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, he was 99 years old. He died peacefully at Windsor Castle this morning. Uh, the news was released just after midday today. Uh, tributes have been coming in from right around the world. Uh, we promised we'd share those with you through the programme. Uh, former US presidents have been paying tribute. Uh, Donald Trump says the world mourns the passing of Prince Philip, a man who embodied the noble soul and proud spirit of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth. Uh, Barack and Michelle Obama said, when we first met His Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, he and Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II had already been on the world stage for more than half a century, welcoming leaders like Churchill and Kennedy, Mandela and Gorbachev. Off. As two Americans unaccustomed to palaces and pomp, we didn't know what to expect. Yes, and that statement goes on. We shouldn't have worried. The Queen and Prince Philip immediately put us at ease with their grace and generosity, turning a ceremonial occasion into something far more natural, even comfortable. Prince Philip, in particular, was kind and warm with a sharp wit and unfailing good humour. It was our first introduction to the man behind the title, and in the years since, our admiration for him has only grown. We will miss him dearly. Inevitably, uh, an occasion like this does have an impact on day-to-day -day life and the death of Prince Philip means that Parliament has been recalled early from the Easter recess. Campaigning for the local elections has also been suspended. Our political correspondent Damien Grammaticus is here. Um, Damien, what will happen on, on Monday when uh, Parliament returns? Yeah, so, so naturally, as you'd expect, there are some changes in the political life of the nation as well. What we will see is on Monday, a day earlier than they would have been returning from their Easter break, uh, MPs will be back. They will sit on Monday afternoon uh, and that will be a special session to pay tributes uh, to the uh, the Prince uh, and what the, the Duke of Edinburgh uh, to Prince Philip. That will be led by the Prime Minister. The leader of the opposition will respond. The Speaker has said he believes that that will go on until perhaps as late as 10 p.m. Uh, and as you were saying too, at the same time, the uh, main party leaders have all announced that they are suspending election campaigning uh, for those local elections, mayoral elections around England, elections too in Scotland and Wales, all of that on hold for the time being uh, while we are in this uh, period. And, and at the same time, Government business too, what we will see is a difference because the ministers uh, will not be out, they will not be doing interviews, government communications will be scaled back other than, they say, important ones dealing with public health in a time of pandemic. Mm. And at this stage, Damien, we can't really predict how long that will last for, I suppose, can we? No, I mean, it, it, this is all a process that is led by the palace. Uh, so uh, because of the uh, the period we're now in, it is the palace that will decide uh, how they wish things to proceed. And the government is there to assist them and to provide whatever support and organisation is necessary. So those meetings are going on now. We know, in fact, right at the minute, there's a cabinet meeting uh, happening. Uh, the cabinet ministers uh, gathered uh, they had over Zoom, they are doing that to offer their own tributes and there have been operational meetings already this afternoon which will look at what support they can provide and particularly again given that we are in a pandemic, how things are best to be to proceed from here. Damien, thank you. That's our political correspondent, Damien Grammaticus. Thank you as well for your thoughts and, and memories that you're sending through. Uh, this one says, as a former member of the crew of the Royal Yacht Britannia, Prince Philip, uh, as many have already said, had a wicked sense of humour and was so human, always ready to have a chat. Yes, let's get another insight now. Camilla Tominate joins us now, former royal editor at the Sunday Express and current associate editor of the Daily Telegraph. She spent 15 years covering the royal family, including many travels with the Queen and Duke. Camilla, hi, welcome to the programme. Thanks for being with us. Hi there. Can you talk to us about your experiences and, and your association with the Duke? 
Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, often you'd go on jobs, obviously, to follow the Queen, but they would both have separate itineraries, and you'd always want to follow the Duke because you never knew what he might say at any given time. And um, I know there's a lot been said about his so-called gaffes over the years, but what I observed when I saw them in America, I went to America with them in 2007, they met George W. Bush, or even more recent visits. I think their last foreign was to Berlin in 2015, which I also went on and there was lots of evidence of him really trying to put people at ease because obviously when people prepare to meet the Queen they can be quite nervous and like rabbits in headlights and he almost acted as her warm-up act really in trying to crack a few jokes to make sure that people's nerves weren't completely jangling on an edge um, and um, always somebody who I mean, didn't really do sort of small talk. If he was going to engage with people on jobs, then he wanted to ask them challenging questions and find out exactly what was going on. Um, not just there sort of as a kind of figurehead, but to actually actively brief himself on what the engagement involved and ask sort of intelligent questions. I know he used to describe himself as the world's most experienced placard Daler, and um, there were lots of tree plantings that went on. But also, you're talking about a guy with a pretty fierce intellect who read voraciously, wrote countless books himself on issues on ecology and conservation and other subjects, and generally wanted to intertwine himself with progress and improvements behind Palace Gate. So, although he never wanted to be a sort of Prince Albert figure sharing a desk with the Queen uh, or in any way involving himself in affairs of state, he was a very modernising force behind the scenes and as which he was head of state, state, he was very much head of the household and the patriarch. Indeed, and for many who, um, thinking back over the past few years, have simply seen him as the Queen's consort, or indeed a retired Queen's consort, we, we begin to get the picture today, the rounded picture of a, a man who had an extraordinary life. Very much so, um, and if you look at him having always been at the Queen's side for all of the things that she has witnessed in her nearly 70-year reign, you get a flavour. But equally, there is a sense of the adventurer about him, um, and I think from a young age, really having a quite difficult childhood in being moved from pillar to post, ending up in Britain, going to Gordonston, very much cutting an isolated figure, but then trying to use that experience for good in creating the Duke of Edinburgh Awards scheme which tapped into his um, love of the great outdoors. Um, there were trips he made to the Galapagos Islands in the 50s. Obviously, he accompanied the Queen on many, many, many foreign tours. They might have given up long-haul travel 10 years ago, um, but other, as other contributors have pointed out, you know, um, their depth of knowledge of the Commonwealth and the countries they visited is sort of second to none. And um, she's always famed for being well across her brief, but so was he. And I think there was an intention really to put this extraordinary role sort of two steps behind um, the most high profile woman in the world having made personal sacrifices in the sake of public duty um, to put that to good use really and try and make a difference. We've been, uh, as we've been going on with this programme, Camilla, we've been reading out various tributes as they arrive. Uh, in the last few moments, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, Harry and Meghan, have um, put a statement out on the Archwell website, and it consists... Well, uh, I can read it in full. It says, In loving memory of His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, thank you for your service. You will be greatly missed. It's quite short and sweet, that, isn't it? I've only just heard about it because your producer mentioned it as I came on the line. Um, I think my colleagues have been trying to contact the Sussexes people, and, and to be fair, in LA, they're eight, nine hours behind, aren't they? So they're only just waking up, and I'm sure more will be forthcoming. Um, but I suppose in comparison to other tributes, it perhaps seems a little short in length. Mm. We, we did hear from a contributor a moment ago who had an on-off relationship with the Duke of Edinburgh over 20 years at various ceremonies, and he said he, he, he appeared very... Very fond of Harry, uh, the Duke. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's no doubt whatsoever. He's absolutely fond of Harry and, of course, famously persuaded Harry when he was faltering at the idea of walking behind his late mother's funeral procession. Um, he was only 13 at the time when she died in 1997, Princess Diana. It was his grandfather who said, look, I will walk with you. It's no doubt at all. And in fact, it's, it's always been underreported. The Duke's great rapport with his 
grandchildren and great grandchildren. I remember observing him at the um, Golden Jubilee um, celebrations outside Windsor Castle, actually lifting a child up out of the crowd. So I think he must have been in his 80s at the time, but still, to hand, I think it was a picture of flowers to the Queen. So, of course, he loves his grandchildren and great grandchildren and it's a difficult situation i think the current suggestion is that prince harry would um return for a funeral but obviously his wife megan is pregnant so might not be able to fly yes indeed uh, camilla listen thank you very much indeed for that insight thank you camilla Dorn, the former royal editor of the sunday express currently associate editor of the daily telegraph after 6.30 on the programme, we're really going to focus on what many people have described as Prince Philip's greatest legacy, the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme. The charity says in the UK alone, uh, because it happens around the world, of course, in the UK alone, 6.7 million young people have benefited from taking part. And um, So as we've said, we'd really like to hear about your stories and experiences of, of being on it, of achieving those awards. Uh, you can text us on 85058. You can get us on social media at BBC. Five Live. Uh, you can also email us if you'd like to drive at bbc.co.uk. In fact, you may have been involved in in delivering that training. Richard Southworth from Bromley has helped young people to take part in the Duke of Edinburgh's award. People who maybe couldn't do it at school, where many do. And he told me that he has seen it change people's lives. Well, I'm retired now, but um, after I finished my professional career, I got involved with volunteering for youth work and stuff, and uh, I ended up running. 12 years I ran a youth centre for kids that couldn't do the award at their school for whatever reason. So yeah, I took people through bronze, silver and gold. And as you may know, if someone completes the gold award, they get invited up to the, one of the royal palaces to meet, uh, well, uh, up until quite recently, the Duke himself and, uh, and get their award. And because I was a leader that helped quite a few people to do that, I got invited up there on several occasions. And, uh, had the pleasure of meeting the man. And and how was he? Because I, I always find on occasions like this, we all have such strong memories of a person that we've we've never met and never interacted with, but you actually got to do that. What was he like? Well, the thing that really stood out for me, the events themselves, you know, there are dignitaries there from celebrities and politicians, local government officials, that kind of thing. And the Duke would be introduced to them and he'd always be very civil and polite, but Every single time I, I went up there, he spent the overwhelming amount of time with the young people. And you could see he got more animated, he was genuinely interested and sincere in asking them questions. And they reacted to him in a, in a really positive way. And that, to me, is, is the mark of the man. You know, that he, he didn't, you know, he, he did respect the fact that you know, there were dignitaries there, but his focus was on the young people, and that's what it was about. A lot of people have talked today particularly about that scheme and, and really described it as a, a wonderful legacy because of the lives it changed. What, what did you see it do for the, the people who you helped through it, Richard? Well, the first thing I'd say is that he had a, a hand in that. He wasn't just a patron of the charity. He wasn't just a figurehead. And I've spoken to senior people in the charity and they all tell you that you know he shaped the ethos of the award. And to answer your question, well, it's true that a lot of people do the awards who are looking to go into medicine or become a vet or whatever, you know, so there are elements of that. But I took people through the award that, are, you know, left school with no qualifications. I've had people with learning difficulties and physical disabilities. And it was an inclusive award. And it, in every single case, what it really did was change those people's lives. And I'm not being melodramatic there. You know, I've got um, genuine memories of, of, and know people to this day who will say it changed their lives and it, it, it opened up a whole new world. And I should have also probably add that people like myself, the adults, all the people that get involved, it, it changes you as well. See what young people are capable of. Uh, that's a real privilege. For people, Richard, who've, who've heard of the scheme but don't necessarily know actually what it involves, they might not have done it themselves, what, what do you actually do? What, what do the young people have to do to, to get those awards? OK, well, I mean, a lot of people just think it's like people go camping and you see them out in the countryside with rucksacks on their back, and that is a, a major part of the award. And um, it's 
probably the one that most people focus on. But there are other sections that we want people have to complete to various degrees depending on the level of the award they do. Um, there's a skill section where that can be anything from learning a musical instrument and all sorts of, you know, have literally thousands of different activities. Some kind of physical activity, and that doesn't have to be team sports, it can literally be just going for a, a run in your local park or whatever. It doesn't have to be anything you get that's going to cost you money. Uh, and then probably the one that I think is underestimated and, and makes a massive difference to our communities around the country is the volunteering section, where young people have to give up their time uh, to their communities, either things like working in a charity shop or even just maybe doing doing the shopping for an elderly neighbour, you know, all sorts of different activities that make a tremendous difference to, to communities. And, uh, and they get a lot out of it as well. It, it sounds, Richard, like, like something... I can tell from the way you're talking, it sounds like you're something, it's something you're really proud of your involvement with. Yeah, I've, I've had lots of emotional um, times so when I've seen young people achieve things that they didn't in their wildest dreams that they were going to be able to achieve. So, yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's a big deal. And it's, uh, as I say, I don't blame people for just thinking, oh, it's all about camping and maybe thinking that's all it's about. But it's not. It's so much more than that. That is Richard, Richard Southworth uh, from Bromley. Rob says, I met Prince Philip about 30 years ago when I received my Gold Duke of Edinburgh Award. I was keeping my head down at the back of the group when he homed in on me and asked where I'd done my expedition. He seemed genuinely impressed when I told him I'd cycled round the Isle of Skye and said, so you made it back OK, to which I replied, just about, sir. Brilliant, says Rob. Yeah, Andrew from Erskine in Scotland says, I'm at the Duke of Edinburgh at Holyrood through the Duke of Edinburgh Awards scheme. He asked if anyone in our group had done their residential abroad. And I replied, you mean like England? He gave a classic old English chuckle and then asked about the residential component of my programme, which was completed in Cramlington, says Andrew. Please keep those stories coming into us. 85058 at BBC Five Live. Well, talking... About the Duke of Edinburgh Award, uh, Sir Michael Palin was a long-time ambassador for the scheme. He told me a little earlier how Prince Philip always seemed to have a bit of a twinkle in his eye. You know, on, on the times that I did, I was really impressed by, by his approach to the work um, and his dedication to whatever he was doing, um, whilst never being sort of too... Um, seriously duty-bound. He always used to have a bit of a twinkle in his eye um, certainly when he met me, <laughs> as he used to say. I think he was very good at teasing people who were perhaps being a little bit PC. I remember him saying to somebody, oh, where, where are you going next, he asked me. And I said, oh, I think I'm going to, to Iran. And he said, well, what, what do you want to go there for? And I said, well, it's either there or North Korea. <laughs> and he laughed uh, quite loudly. And I think he quite liked that. Um, he, 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 had, he had a sort of sense of, of, of fun and enjoying himself, but he was also um, on the ball. He knew what he was doing. He talked to everybody. Um, I was especially impressed with the, um, his, his rapport with the children um, that he was talking to, boys and girls. There was a room full, I should think, of about um, 100, maybe 150 award winners and he took time to speak to almost all of them really as he went he went through there was no feeling that he was doing this out of purely out of duty he just wanted to get away uh, he was immersed in what he was doing yeah, we, 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 listening today as we reflect on his life, um, a lot of people are saying this might be his longest lasting legacy, the Duke of Edinburgh. Well, it's interesting what you say about him there, there was a human being, because from the outside, and I've certainly never met him, you know, you would get the impression that he could be quite irascible. But um, he, he, he did show that human side, and I think it's important we reflect that today. Yes, exactly. Well, I think you can be human and irascible. Yeah, I, I just mean, thought about that as I said the, it. <laughs> the great thing is that he had to. He was involved in an enormous number of charities, met an awful lot of people, all probably asking the same sort of questions, having similar conversations. And I think that he wanted to cut through, um, you, you know, the sort of the, the duty side of it and get straight to what people really had to tell him and um, what he wanted to talk about. He didn't, didn't really like flannel. And I think that was a very good... Um, aspect of, of his personality. He was very straightforward, very usually very direct. He did use humour a lot. I mean he may have got a bit short tempered with people sometimes, but he was also could be 
he could be very funny and you can see that when people were around him they felt relaxed and that's a very difficult thing I think for when you're near a royal you tend to sort of freeze up a bit and everyone thinks oh gosh what do we do but he he was able to um, relax people and make them feel comfortable which was a great quality. I, uh, if you don't mind, I mean, I, I'm not far behind you, but you are a man of a certain age, and, and the, the, there's, a, mm. there's a generational reaction today, and you will have grown up seeing the Duke of Edinburgh over over decades, and there's this discussion mm. today about how he tried to create a role for himself. His role was pre predominantly of, of service. But did, did you find that, that this was part of him trying to find that role, trying to find a little bit of individuality? Oh, I think I'm sure he, he was he's very independent minded man when I've met him or, or seen him talking he he very much um, wants to make up his own mind about things and decide on what he will be interested in and he had a wide variety of interests um, and I think that was very very important for him not to merely be standing behind Her Majesty but to be learning um, and contributing as he went along I think that was that's very very important, and he was he was quite a sort of a clear um, indi individual in the sense that he he seemed to know what he was interested in. He learned about what he was doing, had a lot to say about it. So I think he must have spent a lot of time um, working on his own sort of interests, and, and certainly certainly never wanted to be seen just as a cipher. And yeah, and and I would say you share many of those qualities. Uh, uh, certainly, of an, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll clarify that. Having having an inquisitive mind certainly is one of the things yeah. I, I would yeah, say yeah. you would share. So, would you, could, again looking from the outside, could you understand if there was a level of frustration that he, that, that, that he was in any sense shackled when he wanted to go off and, and, and explore his own interests? I, I don't know. I honestly don't know enough about the. the the arrangements um, um, when you're a member of the royal family. All I can say is, from what I know of him and, and from my uh, from talking to him and, and hearing him with other people, I know that he would be very, very concerned to be um, his own man. Uh, he must, at the same time, have known that the loyalty and duty was very, very important for the role he was playing, and he played that very well. I mean, he he he. He's not a he, he's not a public controversialist. He, he occasionally say things that people would be terribly shocked by, but that was just his way of being, you know, sort of as, as frank and candid as possible. But in the the bigger issues about the royal family and and certainly his role as consort, he he, he took it very seriously. So he must have had to make the balance between the duty and the consort role, and also wanting to uh, use his his role, his position to learn about the world and to help where he could uh, people better understand how we can look after the world, particularly his environmental um, uh, interests. Yes, I, 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 I'm, I'm anxious. You've probably just summed it all up for me there. But really, I'd just like to ask one more question. When you look at him in the in the round, he's had, by any standards, an extraordinary life uh, from, yeah. from, from his from his upbringing, and also <clears throat> a, a war hero, and then uh -huh. married to seven uh, for seventy three years, as you pointed out, to the Queen and, and her consort. How how do you reflect today on 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 this news, and how do you think the nation ought to reflect on on the life and times of the Duke of Edinburgh? I think that we are very fortunate, in a way, to have um, someone like that as as um, consort to um, to the Queen. I mean, I, I I think there will always be questions amongst some people's minds about whether we should have a monarchy or not. <clears throat> I think the Duke of Edinburgh showed that you could have a monarchy that could be interested in things could be helpful could be useful could play a very important role in the life of the country i think that's you know people don't often know that he was interested in all sorts of things like design furniture design all that sort of stuff he was i think um managing during his time to create uh, a better a better country really um and he did his bit from a privileged position which also, you know, involved him having to be on ceremonial occasions and all that. But I think deep down he did 
um, a lot of good in, in, his various, in pursuing his various interests and helping people to get things done who would not have been able to get them done without his support. Well, that was Sir Michael Palin reflecting on his uh, association with the Duke of Edinburgh uh, after he became an ambassador for the award scheme. He was talking to me a little earlier this afternoon. And it is really lovely. Thank you so much for, for sending in your thoughts and memories of taking part in the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme. Jane in Birmingham says, My autistic son went on a tall ship to France and back for his silver. It changed him so much. I'm forever grateful. Uh, we are going to talk more about that because it, it is something that, that so many people have been involved in and it's such a legacy for the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, so your thoughts, your recollections, your memories, your experiences, very welcome, please. Do get in touch and we'll talk more about that in the next hour of Drive. The Voice of the UK. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. BBC News at 6 o'clock. This is James Kelly. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Prince Philip at the age of 99. He'd recently spent a month in hospital where he was treated for an infection and underwent heart surgery. He was the longest serving consort in British history and many of the tributes appraised his constant support to the Queen. The Prime Minister Boris Johnson said his steadfast support for Her Majesty would be remembered. The Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer said the UK had lost an extraordinary public servant. Camilla Tomney is the former royal editor of the Sunday Express. She says he was a colourful character. A very popular figure behind Palace Gates, famed for the fact that he had a very small turnover of staff. In fact, some employees had been working for him literally for decades. I reflect as well on his stalwart support of the Queen. We can't really think of the Queen's reign over the course of nearly 70 years without imagining Philip a couple of steps behind her. And it was like that on jobs. You know, he would almost act as the warm-up man and put people at ease. Commonwealth leaders have led international reaction to Prince Philip's death. The Australian Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, said he'd embodied a generation that would never be seen again. The Indian Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, paid tribute to his military service. The Prince was seen as one of the driving forces behind the modernisation of the monarchy. Charles Anson was press secretary to the Queen between 1990 and 1997. He says Prince Philip's well-known forthrightness was never an issue. His challenges on the way we were handling something were always extremely constructive. They may come across as critical, but his intention was always to try to be helpful and try to move things forward. He was very committed to making a better world, and he has made a better world for young people, for the services that he was so much a part of, and in many other areas, both his ideas and his ability to translate them into action was outstanding. Prince Philip was a supporter or patron of more than 750 British charities, including the British Heart Foundation and the World Wildlife Fund. But the Duke of Edinburgh Awards scheme is considered to be one of his greatest contributions to public life. When it was set up in 1956, it was seen as radical and pioneering. The head of the scheme, Ruth Marvel, says it's improved the life chances of so many. It's his vision and energy that created the organisation that enables many, many young people to be able to access these development opportunities. And he was an absolute sort of stalwart champion for young people's sort of opportunities and development right the way through until he retired. Flags will be flown at half-mast on all government buildings from now until the morning after Prince Philip's funeral. The palace has asked people not to lay flowers outside royal residences and to instead consider making a donation to charity. An online book of condolence has been opened for those who wish to pay their respects. BBC News, it's three minutes past six. Hello, you're listening to Anna Foster and Tony Livesey with a special Five Live Drive programme this afternoon dedicated to the life of the Duke of Edinburgh, who died this morning at the age of 99. Prince Philip passed away peacefully at Windsor Castle. Buckingham Palace released the following statement. It says, it is with deep sorrow that Her Majesty the Queen has announced the death of her beloved husband, His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Tributes have been coming in all day from around the world, and we're bringing those to you through the programme. Speaking at Downing Street earlier, Boris Johnson said that Prince Philip inspired the lives of countless young people. Prince Philip earned the affection of generations here in the United Kingdom across the Commonwealth and around the world. He was the longest serving consort in history, one of the last surviving people in this country to have served in the Second World War. He helped to steer the royal family and the monarchy 
so that it remains an institution indisputably vital to the balance and happiness of our national life. Are the words there of the Prime Minister Boris Johnson, while the leader of the opposition, Sir Keir Starmer, also paid this tribute. Well, the UK has lost an extraordinary public servant in Prince Philip. He dedicated his life to our country. And above all, I think he'll be remembered for his support and devotion to the Queen. And all of our thoughts are with the Queen, the royal family and the British public as they come together to mourn this huge loss. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, has also spoken of the Duke of Edinburgh's passing. My first reaction was uh, to think of Her Majesty the Queen and uh, to feel a deep sense of sympathy and uh, compassion for her and for the whole family at the loss of such a gigantic figure. Well, the Cabinet has come together to meet in the last hour and Parliament has also been recalled on Monday, which is one day early from the Easter recess for MPs to pay their own tributes. All political parties have also suspended their campaigning ahead of the local elections in May. Well, Prince Philip was, of course, the Duke of Edinburgh and the nations and regions of the UK had a special place in his heart. Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, gave her deepest condolences on behalf of the Scottish people. Well, I'm deeply saddened by the news that the Duke of Edinburgh has died and my deepest personal condolences go to Her Majesty the Queen and the entire royal family. First and foremost, he was a husband, a father, a grandfather, a great-grandfather, and my thoughts are with all of those today who will be feeling a profound sense of loss and grief. The First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, expressed his own sadness at the Duke's passing. Throughout his long life, Prince Philip served with selfless devotion and a remarkable generosity of spirit. The Duke of Edinburgh will be sorely missed by the many Welsh organisations that he supported as patron or president over so many decades of service. The Northern Ireland's First Minister Arlene Foster said Philip had a profound and positive impact on her country. Prince Philip was widely respected for his active and dedicated service to the country and for his steadfast support to Her Majesty the Queen throughout her reign. He had a strong interest in Northern Ireland and I had the privilege of meeting him here on a number of his many visits. I offer my deepest sympathies and condolences to Her Majesty the Queen and to all the members of the Royal Family at this sad time. Well, in a moment, we'll speak to our reporters Charlotte Gallagher in Belfast and also James Shaw in Glasgow. We'll begin with Mark Hutchins, who's at Cardiff Castle for us this afternoon. Mark, hi to you. What's the reaction there today? Well, they have lowered the flags here around the walls of Cardiff Castle and above the Norman Keep as well, uh, and the flags are, have been lowered at uh, Welsh Government buildings, and we heard there from the leader of the Welsh Government Mark Drakeford. There's also been a message of condolence from the leader of Plaid Cymru, Adam Price, who said that uh, for over uh, six decades, many young people in Wales will have experienced and benefited from the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme, a reflection of the Duke's many decades of public service. Uh, and you mentioned there the campaigning um, for the local elections being suspended, for the Welsh Senate elections they've been suspended. Uh, as well, and the Senate, uh, the Welsh Parliament, has been recalled for Monday for more tributes to be paid. And, Mark, there is one visit to Wales in particular by the Duke of Edinburgh that stands out. Yes, um, the Duke made, of course, many tributes ar uh, visits around the UK and around Wales and here to Cardiff um, and to the castle. I covered a number of them myself. He also um, opened the 1958 Empire Games in Cardiff, incidentally, not long after Cardiff had been officially recognised as the capital of Wales. But there is one visit that stands out. That was on October the 22nd, 1966, the day after the Aberfan disaster, when a tip of cold waste thundered into Pant Glass School and killed 144 people, 116 of them children. The figures I've read out many times over the years and they don't become any less shocking. But it was the day after that the Duke walked with those leading the salvage operation, talked to the families, and came back with the Queen a week later. Now, one survivor of that tragedy was Anne Murphy, who was six at the time. She was pulled from the rubble at the school, and I asked for her reflections on what the Duke's visit meant. 
it was a great support to everybody in the village at that dreadful time to have the prince be the first uh, royal to visit us and that's always stayed with me um, and I feel it showed the paternal side of him as well um, I don't remember actually seeing the prince myself um, but I know my parents and my aunties um, were very comforted uh, by the visit um, as that conversation went on many times um, on the anniversary of that terrible day every year. So that was uh, Anne Murphy and of course there are many memories and uh, as has been well documented many anecdotes that, that followed the Duke but I think there's a definite poignancy um, of that Abba Van visit that still resonates today. Uh, yes indeed Mark thank you Mark Hutchins there reporting from Cardiff Castle. Uh, to Scotland next and our reporter James Shaw. Uh, James he was the Duke of Edinburgh that tells you all you, you need to know really about how important Scotland was to him. I think that's true. And what's also interesting, Anna, is that his um, connections with Scotland go back for decades, back, in fact, to 1934, when he was one of the first pupils at this new school, Gordonston, uh, in Murray in the northeast of Scotland, which had a new idea about how education wasn't just about the classroom, it was about achievement beyond the classroom through exertion, through resilience. Uh, and he seemed to really benefit from that. He spent five years at Gordonston, and, and people have talked a lot about the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme. And I think that in part is a reflection of the lessons that he learned um, at Gordonstone about achievement um, and resilience. And in fact, that was picked up on by Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister. She said she thought that was really his greatest achievement. He was also the Chancellor of the University of Edinburgh for more than 50 years. And the former Prime Minister, uh, Gordon Brown, was a, a student representative um, uh, many years ago uh, when he was at the university and he remembers that uh, the Duke was um, enormously encouraging um, and supportive and there are a lot of memories I think in particular on Royal D side of course where uh, Balmoral is uh, in the town of Balata there's there's um, huge loyalty I think to the royal family there not necessarily so in all parts of Scotland of course there's republicanism in Scotland particularly amongst people uh, perhaps who are in favour of independence but in that particular part of Scotland there's a lot of fondness for, uh, for the Duke we spoke to um, the man called John Sinclair who is a, a director of Sheridan's the butcher in the town of Ballater who has said that the Duke always took a, a huge interest in uh, in their business the Royals are very much a part of the D-side. Um, and obviously, having supplied the Royals for a lot of years, it's a big loss. Yeah, I've met the Duke several times. He's been in the shop as well, and I wandered through and met all the staff, and he's uh, very popular. It's very hands-on, to be honest. He would like to know what was going on, and um, and any new products he was interested in, it and how we'd thought of it, and how we developed it. And he was very hands-on. The Royals are uh, very protective by the locals here. Um, Obviously, fishing days on the D and I, was, nobody would bother them. They knew the Royals were there, so they stayed clear, let them go and enjoy their holidays. And um, now there'll be a sad loss. Uh, that was John Sinclair from Sheridan's The Butcher in Ballater talking to our reporter James Shaw. And let's head now to Charlotte Gallagher in Belfast. Hello, Charlotte. Good afternoon to you. What's the reaction uh, so far this afternoon in Northern Ireland? Well, we've heard from political figures across the divide here in Northern Ireland, Tony. As we heard, you just played the clip of Arlene Foster, who's the First Minister and DUP leader, saying she was deeply saddened and that Prince Philip had taken a particular interest in Northern Ireland and she paid tribute to his Duke of Edinburgh award scheme and what that had done for teenagers in Northern Ireland. But perhaps the most significant statement has come from Michelle O'Neill, who's the Deputy First Minister and the Vice President of Sinn Féin, which many people regard as the political wing of the IRA. And she said she wanted to extend her sincere condolences to the Queen and her family. And she said for the past two decades, really, the royal family have assisted in building relationships between Britain and Ireland. And she also wanted to reach out to people in Northern Ireland that have a British and Unionist identity, saying that she wished to acknowledge how they were feeling at the moment and the loss they were feeling. And that's obviously got increased significance at the moment, Tony, given the tensions and the violence that we've seen on the streets of Belfast in recent weeks, just last night even. And in fact, loyalist groups have been telling people not to protest in Northern Ireland tonight um, as a mark of respect for the royal family after the death of Prince Philip. That, that's interesting, Charlotte. And, and actually, the Duke of Edinburgh had a long history of visiting Northern Ireland. 
He did, and it wasn't always particularly happy. One of his first visits was in 1966 with the Queen, and a concrete block was thrown at their car, and they didn't actually return for 11 years. They weren't injured in that incident, but they were obviously very shaken by that. So they didn't come back for 11 years, but since then, their visits have been a lot happier. And in fact, Prince Philip seemed to have real affection for Northern Ireland. He made far more many visits here than the Queen. And in fact, one of his last official visits before he retired from public duty in 2017 was to Northern Ireland to meet teenagers who've taken part in his awards scheme. But I think perhaps for people in Northern Ireland, one of the most memorable visits would have been in 2012. There was this really historic moment. I don't know if you remember, the Queen and Prince Philip came and the Queen shook hands with Martin McGuinness, who was then Deputy First Minister, but had, of course, been an IRA commander decades previously. Given that Prince Philip's close relative, Lord Mountbatten, was killed by the IRA. I mean, people decades before never thought that you'd have that moment. The Queen shaking hands with a former IRA man with Prince Philip looking on and I think that really did a lot for relations here in Northern Ireland and actually as I was driving through the city earlier I did see particularly in the loyalist areas that the flags were at half mast here. Uh, Charlotte thank you Charlotte Gallagher there reporting from Belfast you're listening to a special five live drive program with Anna and Tony dedicated of course to the life of the Duke of Edinburgh Prince Philip who died this morning at the age of 99. We have many tributes to come throughout the programme and we'll, we'll look at his uh, legacy too. And we're asking for your stories and tributes. Many of you have met the Duke of Edinburgh at one point or another and particularly uh, around the Duke of Edinburgh Award as well. Many people listening to this or their family members have taken the award and uh, it's changed their lives in one way or another. So we'd love to hear your stories today. 85058 at BBC Five Live. Let's speak to Ben Lord who's uh, got in touch with us. Hello, Ben. Hello, good evening. Now, you uh, were a very naughty boy on the morning <laughs> you, uh, you, you, you met Prince Philip. Uh, explain all, please. Right, so 2002 was the year of Her Majesty's the Queen Golden Jubilee, and at the time I was a 15-and-a-half-year-old uh, student at County Upper School in Bury St Edmunds, and part of Her Majesty's tour of the of Great Britain for the Golden Jubilee was coming to Suffolk. And having been to Ipswich earlier in the, the day on this particular Wednesday in June of 2002, uh, she then came to Bury St Edmunds where she had lunch at the Athenaeum and made an appearance on the balcony uh, with the Mayor of St Edmundsbury at the time. And then together with uh, the Duke of Edinburgh came down into the crowds and walked along the Angel Hill. News of this occasion had obviously come through to us locally and together with a couple of friends, I skipped school for the first time in, and the only time, I might add, in my 13 years of schooling. And I went along and thought, well, there's only once probably that I'm going to be able to see a royal visit to, to Bury St Edmunds. Yes. Um, so I'm going to go and stand on the front or get as close to the front as I could. And you went along hoping for a glimpse and got got a little bit more than that. Indeed. So I stood uh, about halfway along the Angel Hill outside the Angel Hotel and uh, Her Majesty the Queen was on the opposite side talking to well-wishers on the on the opposite side. But uh, the Duke of Edinburgh uh, as, as the was walking on my side where I was standing and as the procession came to a kind of a natural stop, he turned to me and said, well, it's a jolly nice day here today, isn't it? Not just remarking on the on the weather, but on the spirit of the occasion as well. And never having really ever set eyes or, or come into to close contact with royalty before, I simply said, well, yes, it is, sir. It's, it's a terribly uh, fine day or, or something along those lines. Uh, I was somewhat starstruck at, at, at the most uh, highest level you could be. And um, I just thought it was, was, you know, a mere mortal such as I at 15 and a half years mm -hmm. old being a little bit of a rebel. And, of course, Prince Philip himself could be seen as a, a bit of a rebel as well in some of his, his humour that was displayed in the public eye through his long years of service. So I, I just thought that was quite a, a special moment for me that, that I particularly won't forget. I, and, and I guess, Ben, as a result of that, you, you've, you know, you've, you've followed his life with interest, I suppose. One would do if, if one's had a, an experience like that, that that's imprinted itself on... On, on one's brain. So how do you reflect now on looking back on his life and what, what he's contributed to life in this country? 
I've very much been brought up in a family of royalists, and I think the royal family is one of the most unique and remarkable institutes that makes me incredibly proud to be British. Um, reflecting on uh, the, the news today, um, the Duke of Edinburgh has epitomised the very definition of the word stalwart. He has been a stalwart to his family. He's been a stalwart to Her Majesty the Queen. Um, as she famously said back in the 1990s, how much of a, a strength he had been to her, uh, uh, evident over the 73 years of marriage they had. Their life was changed upside down less than five years into their marriage when on the death of the king. And for him to have been that utter brick of, of stalwart and stoicism, which very much comes from that generation that is very, very unfortunately fading quickly now as we pass through uh, years. And uh, yeah, he was, he, he gave his life in, 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 in so many different ways to service uh, both in the military, but, but overall to the country and to the Commonwealth. And for that, it, there is an endless gratitude uh, that each and every one of us uh, across the country and the Commonwealth owes to him. And, and of course, our, our utmost thoughts and sympathy should be with Her Majesty the Queen and the, the whole of the royal family. Ben, uh, thank you for that. Uh, ben Lord there, reflecting on his moment uh, meeting the Duke of Edinburgh. It's interesting what, uh, uh, the, the, how Ben ended that uh, segment because, of course, we're reflecting today on the Duke of Edinburgh and, and, and often we will touch on his life in public service. But uh, on his death today, of course, he leaves behind the Queen. Old Charlie's text of the programme says anyone who's lost their life partner will know that today will be the worst, most painful day of the Queen's life. My heart goes out to her because they were married for 73 years. We are going to speak to a bereavement counsellor later in the programme because behind, uh, behind the royal facade, um, a human being uh, is mourning the loss of her husband today. So we'll reflect on that a little bit later on as well. Mm. There is a lot to remember from a 99-year life, of course, and we've talked about the Duke of Edinburgh's role as the Queen's consort. We've talked about his charitable work. Uh, as a young man, of course, he also had a very active military career. Leaving London Airport on Saturday, one of the Viking aircraft of the King's flight, on which is blazoned the Royal Band, was His Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, Lieutenant in the Royal Navy, bound for Malta and service afloat. Prince Philip is now First Lieutenant and Second in Command of the flotilla leader HMS Chequers, and he will be serving on the same station as his uncle, Vice Admiral Lord Mountbatten, Flag Officer Commanding the First Cruiser Squadron. The good wishes of the nation go with His Royal Highness on his new appointment. Well, that was Prince Sir Philip in October of 1949, taking up his appointment as first lieutenant and second in command of the flotilla leader HMS Chequers. He joined the Royal Navy a decade before the outbreak of the Second World War, as he told the BBC in 1991. The war was threatening, and, and I didn't have anything else to, you know, in mind particularly. And it was quite obvious that everybody was going to get involved. So I, I, it was, it was apparent to me that the best thing that I could do was to join one of the services anyway, if I could. And at that time, I was virtually stateless, I think. Uh, I had a Danish passport, but I, the, the Navy said that they'd accept me. And so I went into the Navy. Well, Philip served in the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean and was mentioned in dispatches for his role in the Battle of Cape Matapan against the Italian fleet in March 1941. He was aged just 19, and it was a battle that he recalled for the BBC's programme, The Duke at 90. There were some cruisers coming down the battleship, and there was a tremendous amount of toing and froing, and eventually the battle fleet, or the Mediterranean fleet under Admiral Cullingham, set off, and we managed to catch the uh, three uh, Italian cruisers coming south in the middle of the night, and, and um, um, they were quite unaware we were there. And, and, the battleships opened fire and blew them out. Well, made an awful mess on this for sure. Well, let's speak to the former First Sea Lord, Admiral Sir Jonathan Band, who's President of the Royal Navy and Royal Marines Charity. Good afternoon. Welcome to the programme. Good, good afternoon. Very good to be with you. He really was an ambassador for the Royal Navy, wasn't he? 
Well, yes. I mean, he was a naval officer. I mean, that's his heart. That's exactly the man that he was. And that was these, the characteristics of the young naval officer who joined the war were what we saw for the rest of his life. I'd like to read you, uh, if I may, um, this account by the late Harry Hargreaves, because in July 1943, the Duke was first lieutenant on HMS Wallace in Sicily, assisting in the, the Allied landings when they came under yeah. attack from an enemy aircraft during the night. So this is an account of that attack. It was submitted uh, to the BBC's People's War Project back in 2003, and Harry Hargreaves was a yeoman uh, serving alongside the Duke. Um, and yeah. this is what he said about Prince Philip's actions in the few minutes they had until the plane returned for a third pass. He said, Philip, the first lieutenant, went into hurried conversation with the captain and the next thing I knew, a wooden raft was being put together on the upper deck. Within less than five minutes, they launched a raft over the side. At each end was fastened a smoke float. Billowing clouds of smoke interspersed with small bursts of flame gave a convincing imitation of flaming debris in the water. The captain ordered full ahead and we steamed away from the raft for a good five minutes and then he ordered the engine stopped. Our tell tail wake subsided and we lay there quietly in the soft darkness. Quite some time went by until we heard the sound of aircraft engines approaching. In the distance, we could see the intermittent flames and the masses of smoke from the raft. The sound of the aircraft grew louder until I thought it was directly overhead and screwed up my shoulders in anticipation of the scream of bombs. The next thing was the scream of the bombs, but at some distance, the ruse had worked and the aircraft was bombing the raft. We lay there quietly waiting for him to leave, which he did. It had been marvellously quick thinking, and in view of everything that came after, I wonder what would have happened to the Royal House of Windsor if Philip had not thought of this ruse and carried it out so successfully. It's quite an extraordinary uh, extraordinary recollection, isn't it? It is, yeah, and I've, I've heard it before, and, it, and it's, it's so indicative of the man we know and and in all the tributes you know that we've all been sharing today i mean one thing that's come out is this this man with huge initiative huge experimentation and it comes out in whether he's talking about technology or his world his work for the world life uh, fund or anything this is the man he was it was something he was was very proud of as well throughout his life. And I, I, I know, because it, it runs in my family, that people who have served in the military are always inevitably proud of, of the contribution that, that they've made. And it was something that, that remained with him throughout. Oh, abso- a- absolutely. And, uh, I mean, it, the, 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 the sad, there were many sad things about the loss of, of George VI, but one of the sad things was that it, it curtailed his his career. And if he, you know, stayed had been married, and but he could have stayed in the navy while she was still the princess for a bit longer, which would have been to the navy's great um, uh, great value, but also to his, uh, because one always felt that there was more to come from him. Well, what do you remember the most about his his connections with the Royal Navy throughout his life, maybe in later life? Yes, well, I mean, I only, I mean, I first met him when I was a captain and I got to know him when I was an admiral and I saw saw him quite regularly. I mean, he never stopped being an naval officer. He, I mean, he obviously didn't didn't work formally for the Navy from, from when he when he did have to give up. But he was a naval officer at heart. He's, he maintained a huge interest in it, uh, both in the technology and the sailors and, he, you know, any opportunity to be with service people generally, not just Navy and Marines, which, of course, he's more associated with, but he just, he just loved it. And he, he, was, he, he never really left us in his mind and, and was keen to explore what was happening now and to pull our legs and to notice a bit of detail that we might have missed in his, his cheeky way. We, we mentioned at the, the start there that, that you are a former First Sea Lord, of course, and, and some said that... If Philip's career in the Royal Navy hadn't been cut short, that could have been a job that, that maybe he might have one day himself done. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there was. I mean, clearly he he was obviously a natural at being a naval officer. He 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 had a, a a good war, if you can say such a thing. But I mean, he he, he saw action in all the, the big parts of the world. He he had those incidents, like the one you mentioned and the Matapan one. So there's no doubt he was very good. And, and after the war, when of course a lot of people left and things slowed up, you know, he became a second in command and then a commanding officer, you know, earlier than most. So every, every indication was that this chap was on a rip-roaring route to the top. Obviously, it didn't happen. We know, we know now why not. But there, there was 
there was, I think, and I mentioned it earlier, I think regret that we, we lost him so early. Uh, whether he'd have got right to the top, I have no idea. I mean, he certainly had many of the characteristics and many of the skills which I would expect to see in a senior officer today. Admiral Sir Jonathan Bond, uh, Band, thank you so much for your time. Really grateful. President of the Royal Navy and Royal Marines Charity and former First Sea Lord. Let's speak now to Sir Hugo Swire, former Conservative MP and Foreign Office Minister, who, who knew Prince Philip. Uh, Sir Hugo, hello. Welcome to the programme. Hello, Tony. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I'm intrigued by your recollections, actually, because I'm wondering, I know you stayed at Windsor Castle, so you met him there, and then you would have various dinners uh, in your role as a Foreign Office Minister. Did you see a mix of the, the public face and the private face of the Duke of Edinburgh? Well, well, first of all, I want to, like the rest of the country, you know, share my sadness at, at his death, and our thoughts are obviously with the Queen and the royal family. I don't want to exaggerate how well I knew him. Um, I wasn't a, a friend of his, and um, but I did come across him both in private time and in public time, and he was an extraordinary figure, really. He was much underrated, and I think he had that quality which keeps older people young, which is an inquiring mind. He was always very, very interested in in the latest technology and what was going on. I mean, he was. if you look back at his career, he was, in a sense, ahead of his time, certainly in terms of um, being interested in science and technology, climate change. And he drove an electric car around London when such things were unheard of. And I think he's always been a bit overlooked, actually. And I know you think this, um, but I, I've also heard the comparison today as well with some of the some of the achievements of Prince Albert as well over these in this sense of being a reformer, being a an innovator w w within and without yeah. the royal family. Well, I think that I think the, the comparison is a good one because I think the similarities go very deep. I mean, they were both um, German princes, basically, who came and married into the British monarchy, and it's not uh, without interest that he is the first consort of a, of a British queen since uh, Queen Victoria. We've had kings otherwise. And they both shared an interest in being modern, frankly, in technology, as I've said. Uh, Albert, with his um, Crystal Palace and the Great Exhibition in 1851, he was one of the moving forces behind that, what's known as Albertopolis, you know, all where the uh, Albert Hall is now and the v &A and so forth. And um, all the different interests that Prince Philip uh, embraced from, you know, he was very, very early on onto the case of uh, climate change. He was very, very keen on how people lived, on housing, all kinds of things. He had this inquiring mind. And I think, I think he was a tough man. I don't think he suffered fools gladly. And I think he always wanted to get to the nub of what was the point in any discussion. And I think that could... Um, that could be sometimes mistaken for impatience. I mean, he was, or for rudeness, he wasn't. He was just wanted to get cut to the quick you, in rather a military way. Yeah, <laughs> yes, indeed. You, you began this by, by giving your sympathies to the Queen, and, and I've already mentioned yeah. on the programme that it, it's it's it, it quite easy to look at the, the public side of all this and forget that, that there is right now a woman grieving the loss of her husband who was married to her for 73 years. There, there's been a clip that we've played on, on the programme today and no doubt we'll repeat later on from the, the Queen speaking uh, to mark their golden wedding. If I can just read it very quickly to you. She says... Uh, he is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family and this and many other countries owe him a great debt, greater than he would ever claim or we shall ever know. And j just off the back of that, I'd, I'd just love your reflections on perhaps his role uh, as, a, as a, a, um, an anchor for the royal family th through generations of, of what, frankly, at some points has been turmoil, how, how he has been there to, to, to anchor down the Queen through those times. Well, and, and to become, you know, a, and he started off life at her side being an enormous support when they were called back from their overseas trip in Kenya when the Queen's uh, father died and she ascended to the throne much earlier than certainly he or she would have would have expected and he's been with her ever since in the good times and the less good times and frankly they've been both over the past seven decades it, it's a remarkable achievement and this is a man who who came into this country as a, as a young man he was educated here but he wasn't from this country and I think people need to remember really the establishment in those days didn't view him very kindly in the same way that they didn't view Prince Albert when he came he, they were viewed with tremendous suspicion and in a sense although he was in a, a sense the quintessential establishment figure being the consort to the Queen he was never part of the establishment and I think that was the case till 
to the day he died, frankly. Um, but throughout all that, he hasn't put a foot wrong uh, by being uh, by the Queen, behind the Queen. And I think he, she will miss him hugely, as will, I think, the rest of the royal family. And indeed, will the many charities with, with which he was involved, the armed forces, the Commonwealth, where he was a great, uh, which he was a great proponent of. I mean, he, this, is, this is a figure who is going to be missed. So, Hugo Swire, thank you uh, very much indeed for sharing that with us, former Conservative MP and Foreign Office Minister. It is 6.34 on drive. Uh, we mentioned that the uh, the Cabinet uh, were meeting just in the last hour or so, um, and I can tell you a little of, of what was discussed there. The Prime Minister led Cabinet in paying tribute to the Duke of Edinburgh, uh, noting that it was a sad day for the country and that His Royal Highness would be remembered with great fondness and affection for generations to come. He referenced the Duke's long and devoted public service, uh, noting, and this is extraordinary, that he had known 16 Prime Ministers uh, in his life. Uh, members of the Cabinet shared their recollections of meeting Meeting Prince Philip, they praised the work that he did as an environmentalist, and of course they talked about the Duke of Edinburgh's award as well, uh, which we too will speak about on the programme in the next few minutes. Um, and ministers did say that they had already received thousands of messages of condolence from all over the world, uh, that their thoughts are with the Queen and the Royal Family, uh, and the Prime Minister said that uh, in the coming days the entire country would have a chance to reflect on the Duke's life, work and legacy. And just another note as well, that at 12 o'clock tomorrow, lunchtime, there'll be a 41-gun salute to honour the Duke of Edinburgh. That will take place uh, simultaneously in, in London, in Belfast, in Cardiff, Edinburgh, Gibraltar, uh, and also on uh, Her Majesty's ships at sea as well, a 41 rounds uh, one round every minute for 40 minutes that will begin at 12 o'clock tomorrow and it's uh, the advice is that the the public observe that moment from home um, um that the the gun salute will take place it says behind closed doors but will be broadcast online and on television and no doubt on radio as well so that will take place at 12 noon tomorrow are you listening to drive uh, with Anna and Tony, let's bring you some headlines. As you've been hearing, uh, Frit Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, has died at the age of 99. In a statement, Buckingham Palace described the Queen's deep sorrow after he passed away peacefully in his sleep this morning at Windsor Castle. The flag at Buckingham Palace has been lowered to half-mast. Tributes have been coming in from around the world. Boris Johnson said that Prince Philip inspired the lives of countless young people. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, said the UK had lost an extraordinary public servant who would be remembered most of all for his extraordinary commitment and devotion to the Queen. And people have been laying flowers outside Buckingham Palace. Hundreds have visited Windsor Castle too to pay their respects. But the government is urging people not to gather or to leave tributes because of the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. The royal family is asking instead for people to donate to a charity and an online book of condolence for people to sign has been set up as well. Now, as we've been reflecting through the programme, many of the tributes to Prince Philip have come from those who are involved in or have taken part over the years in the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme, which he founded back in 1956. Now, in the UK alone, an extraordinary 6.7 million young people have taken part in it. There are currently more than 140 countries who run the scheme. And these awards have been credited with giving young people outdoor experience in a lot of cases and the chance to develop new skills skills to help them pre prepare for, for adulthood. The Duke of Edinburgh was inspired to set up the award by his former headmaster at Gordonston, Dr Kurt Hahn. Prince Philip was heavily involved with the charity as chairman of trustees until his 80th birthday and remained a patron throughout his life. In a rare interview in 1991, marking his 70th birthday, the Duke talked about why he set it up. Well, the idea really was, uh, was to sort of complement the ordinary academic education. The idea to, was, was to encourage people to, to take part in those sort of things which adults eventually find worthwhile doing outside their work. I mean, a hobby, a sport, a, an expedition, a, some voluntary service, that was really the point. And the idea was to give them the experience by exposing them to the possibilities, to give them the experience so that eventually they could choose, you know, from, from their experience what to do later on in life. I think it was, it was, it was a sort of... Uh, do-it-yourself growing up kit. It was, it was an extension of, as I say, of the, of the education system. It is, in fact, achievable by most people, in fact, by practically everybody, because the thing is adjusted to, to the capability of the individual. I suppose, in the end, it's, it's uh, to um, encourage them to do something and to, and to give them some recognition for having done it. Well, we 
had some really, really lovely texts through the programme this evening from those of you who have taken part, uh, whose loved ones have taken part, just talking about how enriching the experience was and, and what it's done for you. So please keep those coming. They're really lovely. 85058 on the text or at BBC Five Live if you want to tweet us. Let's talk to Heather Thompson, who's the South West Director of the Duke of Edinburgh Awards Scheme. Twins, Katie and Sophie Essex, who are Gold Award holders. And 17-year-old Tom Russell from Portsmouth, who recently recently completed his gold award and is an assistant Duke of Edinburgh award leader. Hello to all of you. Welcome to the programme. Hi. Hello. Heather, as we said, that there are lots of people who've done this, but I, I know there will be people who've perhaps heard of the award scheme but don't know much about what it entails. So, so tell us what, what people have to do to actually get those bronze, silver and gold awards. Absolutely, Anna. Thank you very much for, for having us on. And as, as you said earlier, our thoughts are very much with, with His Royal Highness and his family. His family. Um, so the, the award is really for, for young people. Um, as you mentioned, three levels. They have to undertake four sections at bronze and silver, and there's a fifth, fifth section at gold. And that's really to take part in a volunteering activity in their community, um, a physical activity, um, a, learn a new skill or an existing skill, improve upon a skill they're doing, and also, as, as you'll be aware, is undertake a, a, an expedition and sort of the the award becomes more challenging as you progress through the levels and, it, and the time commitment required for each level increases. So, I mean, I think that's the key thing about, about the award. It actually um, requires a significant amount of commitment from young people to, to achieve an award. So those who achieve it have done incredibly well. Mm. You mentioned the expedition. That's the one that always comes to mind for people, isn't it? The one they <laughs> always think about. Absolutely, it is, and, and I think you, you, you talk about the Duke of Edinburgh's award and you think about young people trekking across Dartmoor, but actually it's never been more relevant at this current climate. You know, we found during the this sort of recent pandemic how young people have not only sort of really embraced that, their volunteering and how valuable that volunteering has been, but they, you know, continue with it and really making a difference in their community. So it is definitely an all-round programme. There's so many aspects to it, and it's very insightful, I think, um, of His Royal Highness setting it up back in 1956. Uh, Katie and Sophie, we mentioned that, that you were both gold award holders. Um, Katie, tell me what, what what actually got you into it in the first place? Um, well, while we were at school, we were just looking for things really that we could do extra to fill the time, but also, you know, have something to achieve. And we we'd heard from other people and family members that the Duke of Edinburgh Award was like a good scheme where you can build lots of skills and it definitely showed that you know from starting at bronze to doing gold we were able to you know build loads of different skills that you know I don't think we would have been able to enhance as much just through school and you know through life so it was really you know great opportunities were provided through the Duke of Edinburgh's award which we really enjoyed and um, yeah yeah. Sophie, tell me a bit more about, about what you learned, about what you took on. Yeah, so um, for us, it, I mean, from the outset, from bronze, it was, it starts off really achievable and although there's some mental and physical challenges throughout, you sort of get drawn in and by the time we got to our gold expedition and our gold um, residential opportunities, that really showed, um, well, that we had to definitely learn a lot about ourselves and grow individually throughout those things. For example, our, our, our expedition was for gold was personally what felt 10 times harder than the rest, which made it more of an achievement. So we had to push ourselves and push, push ourselves as a team, but together we got so much out of it, not just friendships, but the experience and personal knowledge that you can get through things, you've just got to give yourself that opportunity. So we were so grateful that our local sixth form was able to give us um, the Gold Duke of Edinburgh award scheme, because without it, we may not have had these enhanced skills for our future careers, which we, we're now living. <laughs> Yeah. T tell me a bit more, because I, I do love hearing about people's expeditions. Tell me a bit more about that, that gold one that you said was so challenging. Yeah, so we, we went to um, the Isle of Arran in Scotland and we'd never really heard or would have probably would never have gone there without our, our expedition. But there were so many memorable things. I mean, over time, the, the horrid parts have dwindled and we just laugh at them. 
such as we went on a be beach walk. Well, it sounds nice that I say it's a beach walk, but it ended up being an a, a literal race against the tide um, when we had to get round a corner mm -hmm. of the cliff. So that was, at the time, it was stressful and you sort of, you do panic, but looking back, it was such a great laugh because, well, we, we, we survived it. <laughs> yeah, and, and also it's when you, when you face those challenging moments and get through them, and, and that's an achievement that you always look back on, don't you? I think in future tough times, and you say, look, we, we managed that, so we can do this. Exactly, it's that determination that's built up throughout all three awards. That determination and self-confidence that you get, it really does help because... Oh, I think that line might on just... the top of the moors while the mist is rolling over the hills, and. How, how are we going to get down from here? I tell you what, that line has just gone a little bit clicky, so we'll, we'll leave uh, Katie and Sophie for just a second, um, because Tom is listening to that as well, Tom from Portsmouth. Now, as we said, Tom, you are about to complete your gold award. Um, it's been held back a little, obviously, because of the coronavirus restrictions. Um, the bit that you still have to do is the bit that Katie and Sophie were talking about being so difficult there. What, what have you got planned for your for your gold expedition? Yeah, it is. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm part of uh, scouting, so the expedition uh, for me is something I'm actually looking forward to, to doing. Um, so I, I kind of can't wait for the restrictions to ease enough for us to, to get out on one of them. Uh, I mean, at the minute, the DV's uh, award scheme's been really good to kind of uh, work out flexibilities we can give to participants. That's been how I've been able to complete my gold, even though the last year has been uh, kind of very strange, I guess, is the best way to describe it. Uh, various different activities we could uh, do to complete it. And in terms of the expedition, looking ahead to the summer, uh, I mean, hopefully we'll be able to get some expeditions out and I'll be able to get on one of them in the summer, but there's various different ways uh, I could look at doing it, whether that's uh, potentially uh, not camping and just doing the walking and then um, kind of carrying a tent and uh, all the rest, but then unfortunately not being able to camp, uh, that, that wouldn't be ideal. Uh, but there's kind of uh, potentially uh, everyone in the group have their own tent uh, and do it that way and kind of maintain some social distancing while we're walking. Um, so basically, as soon as uh, we're, we're able to, to get an expedition out uh, in whatever form that may be, uh, I'm looking forward to going and, uh, and finishing off my Golden Award. Yeah. I want to talk to you about your, your um, assistant leader work as well, but I just wanted to bring Heather back in at that point because Heather, listening to, to Tom talk there and, and his confidence and his problem-solving skills, that he was, you know, he's already looking ahead to, to how he's going to get this done and, and, and walking it through. And, and, and you see, really, in that what it brings to people, don't you? You do, absolutely. And 